Okay, well, once again, welcome to day two of the event. I have to say that I had the privilege of having uh, already glanced through all of the presentations for today, and I assure you, you will not be wasting your time. So let's get started. I pass to my colleague, Vera Eredi Plus, who will be presenting our keynote speaker for today, which is Leslie Poris. Yeah. Vera, over to you. Thank you, Nuno. Hello and welcome. It is my great pleasure to present our next keynote speaker, Leslie Poris, who is based in the, in the US and is joining us from Kansas City, Missouri. Leslie is the manager of sector strategy at water.org, a global nonprofit organization that helps people to access to safe water and sanitation through affordable financing. Leslie has an impressive resume. As manager of sector strategy, Leslie builds relationships and develops messages that can influence and spread water.org's innovative solutions to the access of water and sanitation finance. Her passion for water goes back to the time when Leslie was lecturing in water in secure Uzbekistan with the US Peace Corps and her subsequent work experience includes the World Bank, the World Resources Institute, the Carter Center, the United Nations Development Program and the Deshpandi Foundation. She holds a master's in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a master of arts in law and diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Leslie is also a regular author and co-author in the water and sanitation sector. Leslie, thank you. you. We are so grateful for your time and for sharing your knowledge here at the Water Summit. Let me unmute you, hold on. Thank you, thank you for that, Vera. Um, I am honored to have been invited to be here speaking with you all today. And I think this is a great summit and a great, um, a great community to really discuss the work that water.org has done to really look at the water and sanitation crisis and solve it from a financial component and lens. Uh, next slide. So, this is just the basic time things that I'm going to cover, um, but I have a lot to say and not so much time. So let's uh, let's move forward. So yes, and I think you've been hearing if this is day two, obviously you understand at this point, if you didn't before, there definitely is a water and sanitation crisis. You can read all of these, you can read all of these numbers. I don't need to read them out loud to you, um, but I think there's there's a lot of components here and let's move forward. Um, but we can think about the water crisis in a number of different ways. Um, the statistics, most of which that I shared a moment ago, really point to the health crisis that water, that lack of access to, to safe water and sanitation can have. Um, and actually some of this alluded to it also, this is predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly a women's crisis because the people who are faced with collecting water tend to be women. Um, and the ones who are experience more difficulty if you go outside to defecate also tend to be women. Um, similarly, a woman may not go alone to collect the water. She may also go with her children and especially her daughter, therefore making this a children's crisis, also influencing their ability to access education. Finally, what a lot, or not finally, but one aspect that water.org looks at very critically is the economic impacts. And I actually don't think I have to spend much time on that right now because we're in the middle of COVID and all of the global um, uh, economic impact that has been that we have been experiencing as a result of this crisis. I think that actually speaks for itself better than I could. There is also an environmental component to this. If you are not, if you are not accessing safe sanitation in particular, you can threaten the water supply. So all of these things, I could go on and on, but all of these things are really connected to each other. You just have to remember which one you want to think about at a particular time. And when you think about this, um, it's hard for a lot of us who, who are in the, comf you know, the comforts of our home um, with all of the nice resources with sinks and faucets to not really think about this. But uh, um, if we move on, there is a, a video message um, from our more famous co-founder that helps you think about it differently. 
We're so used to having water right at our fingertips. You simply ask for it or you turn on a tap and it's there. I'll start with water. I need to have a shower. I would kill for a glass of water to start with this. Unfortunately, I can't do that for you today. We don't have any water. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, bit of bad news. There's no running water in the hotel. Oh, fine, okay. Oh. Okay. You don't have any water? Yeah. Wait, what? Lá já não tem mais água. No, we just No. Que nos quedamos sin agua. Ya comandé su pedido. Va a demorar seis horas. It usually takes them quite a few hours, like six hours. You have a man down if you do. You just get through the day without water. Not everyone has it. Not everyone has it, but people need it. And if you come to a hotel, you, you kind of expect it. I'm just like, should I go somewhere else? I have my time, it's very valuable. No, no, I'm I'm just gonna call him really quick. I'll be right back. Okay, yeah, if you could just hang one second, I'll, I'll fix okay. all this. I'll, all right, I'll like one more second, and then otherwise, I'm gonna have to go somewhere else. Be right back. Thanks. Hey, you. Hi, Matt Damon. It's hard for us to truly imagine what it would be like to not have access to water. But for 663 million people in the developing world, reality is different. Millions of people spend up to six hours every single day just to collect water. Can you imagine what that would be like? If you had to choose between having a job and having the water you need to survive. What if it was your sister or your daughter who didn't have time to get an education because she had to spend hours a day securing this basic human need instead. So that is why Stella Artois has partnered with us at water.org because we want everyone in the world to have time for what's important to them. Thinking about, you know, it literally being an all day thing six hours to go get water. <sighs> it's... I can't imagine what that'd be like. Ou não ter acesso à água de maneira... de maneira fácil... <laughs> é impensável. Actually got me thinking, gosh, what, what am I complaining about? Ves que en el mundo es un problema real. Me emocioné. I don't know, maybe I take water much more grander than I thought. You can help us by simply sharing this message or by buying a pack, you can help give back their precious time. Together, we can change this. Together, we can give them time back. We're so you. Thank you for that. And that is not, that's not supposed to be an advertisement endorsement. That is definitely just helping you understand the, the scope of the, the situation when it can be really hard to comprehend it from, from where we are. But this is not an easy solution and it is not cheap, right? So if you look at these numbers, $114 billion per year are required to solve um, the water and sanitation crisis from six, from 2016 until 2030, right? That is three times the level of investment that currently goes into the system. And that means business as usual, as Katerina de Albuquerque said yesterday, is absolutely required. So, so what do we do? What is the, what is the new business as usual, right? Well, this is the fun part. <laughs> so um, we, as water.org, co-founded by Gary White, alongside uh, the, more, the more visible Matt Damon, um, has been thinking about solving the water and sanitation crisis from a financial angle for uh, more than 15 years now. Um, I'm excited to say that back in the beginning when we started pioneering these solutions, we were a little bit on the periphery and no one really wanted to talk about the financial aspect of water and sanitation. And these days, um, there, is a lot more, there is a lot more understanding and thought around this process. 
So you can see we're across 13, we're active, I should say, in 13 different countries right now. And we work on the ground with um, nearly 150 different partners. And together, you know, we have really helped about 29 million people to access water and sanitation. That video is from a few years ago, which also shows scale, which I'll get to later in the conversation. Next slide. So fundamentally, um, what this is what we do and our core flagship model, right? We work, we partner with local financial institutions. They are already present in a country. They are already lending to lower income groups. And we say to them, hey, we think you should develop a loan product specifically for water and sanitation. So people can connect to their existing water source or dig a well if they need to, or construct a toilet. And usually the gut reaction of the financial institutions are like, no way, that's crazy. Um, you don't earn money off of a toilet. Like that's a high risk. I don't know that these people are gonna pay me back. So they're really reluctant to, to dip their toe into the water and sanitation financing space. We say, well, you know what? We actually are really confident that people pay back these loans. They're very small. And we're going to help you out by giving you a teeny bit of project preparation funds, basically. We give them a very small grant, but it only goes into the research that they have to do to design what is, how much should a loan cost? You know, how much does a toilet cost? How much does a water connection cost? M assessing their market. Are people here really interested in toilets or only in water, right? We give them the, the grant to cover the sunk costs that they have to develop the product. Then they, and also, you know, they're not, they're finance people. They're not water and sanitation people. So maybe they bring on some expertise as, you know, for consultation and guidance. So that's what that money covers. But then they turn around and they lend to these lower income households. We do not, and this is very important, we, water.org, do not give them the money that they lend. They are sourcing that money from whatever they usually do, whether it's, whether it's savings from their, from their um, existing clients or whether they're taking bulk loans from a local financial institution. They're accessing their domestic financial resources, nothing, of, nothing from water.org. So then they lend to the people and the people construct or manage the construction of the toilets that they want, the water connections that they want, um, and then they repay the loan. And this doesn't sound like rocket science, but as I said, when, when we started experimenting with this back in 2004, we were speaking a foreign language. I'm excited to say that it's not the same anymore. And we can move on. So what this sort of gets to is the idea that people make a lot of assumptions about poor people, but not everybody is the same kind of poor, right? Um, we, can, we can keep you know, filling out the whole slide. Um, so beneath the poverty line, there are tons of different gradients of people. There is a core group at the bottom who are always going to need charity. They're always going to need help from the philanthropic organizations, from their governments. And, and that is a very important role that needs to be played by those organizations. But there's this whole group of people in the middle who if they just had tools that actually accommodated them and their specific needs in terms of timing, in terms of amounts, then they are perfectly capable and want to be responsible for their solutions. And that is exactly the space where we like to fit. And we also, you know, we also believe that if we are helping to sort of fix and address that group in the middle, access their own finance, then they don't need the charity and the charity can go to the absolute bottom where it is absolutely needed. Uh, next slide, please. So what, and the question that I usually get is what does this actually look like on the ground? In, so I wanted to do, and there's actually two slides related to this. I'm first going to show you what this looks like in India. And it's, you know, um, and India is where the bulk of our, of our impact has been. Um, so, 
And you can see that water loans tend, you know, have a couple of different, have a couple of different varieties here. More often than not, it is actually paying the connection costs to link into an existing piped system. Of course, there aren't always piped systems. So in those cases, then there are bore wells or tube wells. Um, in many cases, sometimes it's actually filters that are really important to people. Um, on the sanitation side, we can we look at you know toilets with septic tanks. There are also more environmentally um, you know dual pit poor flush latrines. And also one thing that's really important is that if a lot of in the cases of in the case of India, many when people are constructing their toilets, it was very important um, to also have a space to bathe. Um, so then the space is larger than what you would need for just a toilet. So if you look at these dynamics here, we have an average loan size. I don't really like averages because even the cost between water and sanitation loans is quite different. But on average, we're looking at about $200. Um, you'll see that almost 70% of these loans in India go for sanitation. That's a pretty big deal. Um, water is usually an easier sell, shall we say. Um, and you can see it's also 83% rural and 99% female. And um, I can go into some of the whys of that later in the Q&A if, if more of you are interested, but it is notable. And let's, let's move over to Peru now for a comparison, right? So I think if you notice this differently, I think the thing that sticks out at you the most is that we've just climbed in terms of loan size to over $1,000. Right? This reflects obviously the cost of living and cost of goods and services in a country and also the scale of what the loan is expected to cover. Um, the, the, the constructions that happen in Peru are often a little bit more fancy, shall we say, and that is where that country is. Um, and you can see that it's also more centered in Peru. It's more centered around urban, actually peri-urban specifically in Peru. Um, and it's a little bit more 50-50 in terms of female versus male borrowers. Um, I'll move, we can move on. So, but that's also just to show you that we have those differences. It's not uniform across the world. It very much depends on country context. So across our 13 countries um, to date, as I was noting, we did reach 29 million people um, through these loans. Um, not only the people who took the loans, but also their families, right? Um, that is through 6.5 million loans dispersed. And those loans account for 2.3 um, 2, 2 billion in terms of capital mobilized. Um, and what we, what we mean by the capital mobilized there, yeah, you can keep it here. Um, what we mean by the capital mobilized is that's what the loans amount to. So those 6.5 million loans account for 2.3 billion in expenditures. And again, that is not water money that water.org has put into the system. You see what we have given is actually only 35 million. So 35 million to these different, inst these different lending institutions has generated 2.3 billion. That's huge. When you look for when you look for value on uh, return on investment, I'm talking to a lot of business school students, right? So um, again, here are um, again the overall global the global averages. Like I said, I don't really take too much stock in these because it is so diverse across the countries where we work. Um, but I will I will say on average the you know some of the the important aspects is you will see it is 87 percent female borrowers. In many cases, microfinance institutions prefer to serve women. Um, they see them as a lot more reliable um, and much more likely to, to actually repay the loan. Um, you can see it is 60% rural overall. You can see that our repayment rate is 99%, which goes against all of the, all of the theories and misperceptions that, oh my God, these are poor people and they're not gonna pay me back for their toilet, right? And I also will note that um, almost 90% of the households that we serve have daily incomes of $6 a day or less. These, these, are, these are critical uh, statistics. And you can actually, and from that $6, you can break it down even further here to understand that. 
but we we value very important very significantly our ability to reach people who are genuinely low income and so that these metrics and understanding where people fall within this is very important to us next slide so why why has this been successful let's move can explore some of these ideas. So one of these things here is we, de we designed to be very flexible. The idea is that we partner with an institution and that they appropriate and mainstream, once they're comfortable with this model, they mainstream it internally and they keep it even if they're no longer working directly with us, right? We don't tell them exactly how the loan has to look. We might work with them to develop out the terms. We don't decide who is an eligible client. They get to decide fundamentally who they lend to and, and who they don't, right? Um, we also help them think about and maybe improve some of their outreach and marketing strategies. Um, again, these aren't always water and sanitation people. So knowing how to sell water and sanitation sometimes needs a little bit of assistance, right? And if there is other local coordination strategies that can be facilitated, we will go in there and do that. But I should say, we don't partner with just any institution. We vet them very carefully because this is a lot of responsibility. This is a lot of trust. This is a lot of autonomy. And if any of you, in, if any of you listening out there are very involved in development, um, the flexibility here can be somewhat challenging, right? Normally, if I'm sitting down and talking to some of the development banks, they wanna know, they wanna see the term sheet, they want to understand all of the exact specifics. And I can't give them that because it varies from partner to partner and we don't mandate it. So it's not a cookie cutter approach. There is a lot of internal flexibility here. And that is, in my mind, why it is successful. Move on, please. And so you don't have to hear it from me. Now I'm going to, you're, you're probably tired of me at this moment. So we're going to move actually back to India and hear from some of the different borrowers from their perspectives. Okay, bathroom unda nam valla more in the koi iban dekho ande. Ki puru separate ga ande ga bati aim customer in le the loan gat koin gula makhi zige ne ande. There are a couple of reasons why micro lending for water and sanitation at the household level has been so successful in India. From the consumer's point of view, this solution gives them the freedom to design what is most appropriate to meet their own needs, keeps them rested and really increases usage of the facility. From the lender's point of view, uh, they have been comforted that the repayment rate right from the beginning has been close to 100%. And they've also realized that lending for water and sanitation is not just good business, it also leads to huge improvement in the social condition of their borrowers. हमने इसमें सर लेटरिन बाथरूम बनाई है पहले सर था लेकिन थोड़ा असुविधा होती थी सर इधर दूर पड़ जाता था उधर पास बना ली पास में पड़ता है सर जाती बच्चे टाइम पर तैयार हो जाते स्कूल जाने में दिक्कत और ये आपका खुद का हो गया हां जी पोदो कढ़ाई ले रेंट वाला का कड़ा किंतु पढ़ाई बड़ी नमल के 10 कोड़ा नाल नमक के वेण मुट्टे कालेंजेतल 5000 எடுத்து இப்ப பரவால சார் அதே நிம்மதியா 10 कोड़ा नाल நிம்மதியா புடிச்சிட்டு நான் ஆளுகள் என்னாலும் கூட लज लगे नईटेलू पर्वा डेरेलू पर्वा यहाँ रिस्क नाम पड़े ना इतनी आवे स्व भय आगे नईटेल ऐन नम्बर लूज मोशन ऐन आज कष्ट आगता हेगोदू अल्ली बरसे ना कुत्को बटे हो मन मकल ओदी वे मद्वेमी को इन इबूर ओद्ता 
ಎರಡನೇ ಹುಡುಗಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಇಯರು ಮೂರನೇ ಹುಡುಗಿ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡರ್ಡ್ ಓದ್ತಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಇವಾಗ ಮೈತ್ರಿ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆ ಕಡೆಯಿಂದ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಲೋನ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟರು ಸರ್ ಅವ್ರು ಲೋನ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟ ಮೇಲೆ ನಾವು ನಾವೇ ಇದ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡು ಟಾಯ್ಲೆಟ್ ಕಟ್ಟದ್ವಿ ಸರ್ ಮತ್ತೊಂದು ಕಾಯಿಲೆ ಬಂತು ಅಂದ್ರೆ ನಾವು ಆಸ್ಪತ್ರೆಗೆ ಇಕ್ಬೇಕು ಒಂದ್ ಸಲ ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ರುಪೀಸ್ ಬೇಕು ತೌಸಂಡ್ ರುಪೀಸ್ ಆಗ್ಬಿಡುತ್ತೆ ಒಂದೊಂದ್ ಸಲ ಜ್ವರ ಬಂದ್ರೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಬೇದಿ ಏನಾದ್ರು ಆ ತರ ಆಗ್ಬಿಟ್ರೆ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ರುಪೀಸ್ ಹಂಗೆಲ್ಲ ಖರ್ಚಾಗ್ಬಿಡುತ್ತೆ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಆಗ್ಲಿ ದೊಡ್ಡವ್ರಿಗೆ ಎಲ್ಲ because at the end of the day the poor are not a problem to be solved we believe they have the capacity and the potential to solve their own problems provided they have access to the right financial tools okay So, yes, so a lot of videos, but again, this is this is a system that it is working. And then what we realized is that it was working. And then we wanted to take it to scale. And I'm sure that is a topic that comes up with your in your studies, etc. all the time. So, let's move forward. So, and again, you could see water.org didn't just immediately start with success, right? I mean, we definitely were it was a it was a concept that was new and people weren't super comfortable with it. um and again we actually started in 2004 which isn't even on this which isn't even on this right but i would say it was 2011 when we started to pick up so you can see here that we've actually especially within the past few years been able to really scale um and and accelerate this impact and the question is what's how have we been able to do that because and how do we keep doing more of that so we've started expanding the way in which we work the model that i've described to you remains our core model and that is the direct you know one to one relationships that we have with financial institutions but we've started thinking about different type of institutions not only financial institutions i'll talk a little bit later about some of our work with utilities as well but then also we've grown into actually establishing larger partnerships and we call that collective impact right we can work with and through others it doesn't all have to be done by water.org itself because the problem is way too big for a a a staff of less than 200 people. And finally, what I think you also hear is, you know, we we look at also ways of changing the system, right? Are there policies, are there regulations, or is there thinking about water and sanitation that if you change perspectives, if you change laws a little bit, you basically can open the floodgates to more and better financial solutions and finance available to people at the bottom. So as I just said um this this is a lot of writing here and I'm not going to actually I can simplify this quite a bit. We started realizing that working with utilities was also, you know, just as important as working with financial institutions. A lot of utilities have difficulty reaching into low-income neighborhoods and partly they do this for the same reasons that financial institutions don't want to go there. They don't believe that um that these people will repay. and they also um and also they do charge this connection fee up front that households are challenged to to pay for all at one time so what we do in many cases is we convince them that they should go into the lower income neighborhoods uh, within their area and then we also help them to develop installment plans internally so maybe people don't have to pay the whole connection fee at one time and they can embed it with their monthly water fee that you know over a period of of a year or something like this so that's part 1 we also work with the utilities to help them um to help them 
do things that I think a lot of you guys are doing with your MB, you know, with your MBAs, develop business plans, improve their operational practices, basically everything that if they were to apply for a commercial loan, they would have all of their, we would say ducks in a, in a row, right? Because usually utilities are staffed predominantly with engineers. They get their money from municipal governments, right? They don't, they don't have people who, are, who can do financial planning, business planning. Um, so we have these two different, we have these two different work streams where we help the utilities to improve their business to access finance and also help them develop their internal tools to reach into and further within the lower income neighborhoods. So I'll move on. And and we can cut, yeah, just go through all of this. I'm, I'm not only going to glance over this really briefly, but we also look at, you know, when we go back to the financial institutions, you know, some of them are happy to accept grant money and that's all they need to be incentivized to do a little bit, you know, to develop a new product. But some of the bigger banks say, we don't need your money. Like, we're not worried about that, but we're worried that these people won't repay. So what we've been developing in cooperation with the IFC is a global credit enhancement facility that is about to roll out at this moment um, in India. And we're already looking at next countries for replication and expansion. But the idea is that IFC will provide 50% of the fund and we will, we, water.org and other donors provide the remaining 50%. And this becomes a first loss guarantee that is offered to banks that will lend for water and sanitation purposes. So we're further reducing the barriers um, and de-risking, you know, from a perception standpoint and a real standpoint, um, the lender's ability to play or willingness to play in this space. And let's move forward. I should actually say um, that this is the first of, of many different sort of financial, larger scale financial transactions that we're looking to facilitate. And again, when I talk about sort of the influencing systems change, this also requires, again, that perception doesn't change, fa doesn't change fast, right? So this requires us engaging with a lot of different actors in different varieties, whether it's, you know, having Matt Damon meet with Jim Kim, who was then president of the World Bank, whether it's writing and co-writing papers with other, um, with other sector experts to help stimulate thinking um, and these two of these pictures are also from close work that we've done with the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation in India, which is now called the Ministry of Jal Jakti. But really, and also they happen to already have a national sanitation campaign that was very easy for us to help them understand how some of these ideas aligned with their own national objectives. So there's a lot of different ways that we continue to play and we continue to evolve and think more and differently about what else can be done because 2030 is only getting closer and there's still a long way to go. So with that, I probably extended my time and I apologize, no, but, uh, <laughs> but- Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Leslie. It was really uh, wonderful. Um, it was really interesting and uh, it's amazing to see how we live in our uh, bubble and um, seeing this reality from a, a totally different uh, perspective. It's very valuable. Um, and it is really amazing to see what you have been doing uh, in the field for more than 20 years, empowering all uh, people, uh, people all around the world, giving them access to safe water and sanitation through these financing tools. You know, this, is, this subject is very dear to us at Catholic Lisbon. Earlier this year, we signed a partnership uh, with the UNO Center DACA to work on um, solving social and environmental problems through the implementation of the social business concept. So this is, this is an issue that it's very relevant to our school. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I also have questions from the audience uh, and I'm gonna try to at least, um, you know, deal with the time that we have. Um, and would be wonderful to, to, to understand a little bit better. So um, your partner-based model seems very uh, complete, um, but you also mentioned when you, when you, um, when you start talking with the microfinance institutions that there's kind of a resistance in terms of the wash. Um, 
of the wash, um, how can I say, uh, uh, issue, uh, you know, for these um, MFIs uh, to incorporate wash in their portfolios. Wh why is that? Yeah, well, because again, when in microfinance traditionally, and when it started in Bangladesh, um, it was done for income generating purposes. So you give, you give a poor person, a, you know, a loan so they can buy a cow and start a dairy. Or you give a woman a small loan so she can buy a sewing machine and some supplies and start a seamstress tailoring business, right? And they can bank, and they tend to not really charge any kind of collateral or require, I should say, any collateral. So they're banking on literally the fact that these people will be successful at whatever their business is, and that is what will generate the repayment for them. They don't see an income generation connection with water and sanitation. As I said, they say, you know, they're not gonna earn money off this toilet. So how are they going to pay me? They're poor. How are they going to pay me back? And I can't repossess a toilet, right? Or what, I'm gonna dig up their water connection pipes? Like they, yeah, it's, and also these loans, yeah, it's, it's just a, a core lack of, uh, it's a fear. It's a fear and it's a misperception. Right. So it really looks like, um, so looking into the pyramid, that you really have filled, uh, um, I would not say middle tier because we are talking about the poverty uh, line, but you are not charity, right? So you're not a charity oriented program. So this is no. something that people should be aware that you are actually providing people uh, with uh, financing uh, tools in order to get access to, to water, that it's not donated, right? Yes, and I should say again, we give a very small grant for some operating expenses, for some research and development expenses to the financial institution or the utility. Um, we don't give them money that they lend. They have to source that locally. And if many of you probably in some of your, your studies or whatnot, you're looking at the different SDGs, Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Goals, I imagine, and SDG 6, you know, SDG 6 is the one for water and sanitation. Um, when we talk about those numbers, that 14 billion per year, that's for achieving X SDG 6.1 and 6.2. And I should have actually said that that number is only for capital infrastructure, new infrastructure. It doesn't include operations and maintenance costs. Those haven't actually been projected. Um, we need to stimulate more domestic sources of capital from the countries themselves. We need to bring in more private investment because, as we said, the donor, the donor and philanthropic community isn't going to be giving more, right? And it's, you know, we need three times more than what's being input now. So we need more of these kind of solutions that really can figure out ways to actually generate that money from the countries themselves and from new and different types of of players. Sure, which is the, um, considering the time that we are living right now, it's, it, it's, it's getting harder and harder, uh, I, sh I, I believe. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> um, so when you decide to go into a, a, a new country, to expand into a new country, um, how do you, I mean, what is your business development strategy? I mean, how do you uh, plan and how do you identify um, when you need to go uh, into a, a new market? Oh, I can tell I'm talking to business students. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's a great question. You know, we haven't entered a new market in quite some time. I think the newest, well, I should say that we are, um, we are entering Mexico. We're in the process. It just barely started lending there recently, actually. Um, and Brazil would be the two newest countries that we have entered. Um, I unfortunately speak neither Spanish nor Portuguese and was not very much involved in, in that okay. process. But we okay. do go, um, we do go through, well, you know, our own market assessment. We want, we don't go into a country where there really isn't lending because it's not our job to go in there and teach people how to lend, right? Sure. We are taking, and this is actually another point I should have highlighted that I think is good about our model. We're working with pre, we're not starting from scratch, right? Okay. We're taking something that is already there. It's a financial institution. They're already lending to the poor. We're just saying, 
just add this, just do this a little bit differently. And right, we're so we we look to make sure that there is the right kind of financial market. We get a lot of requests to go into into countries where the need is very high, but they don't have some kind of financial market that could support this. And that for us is a challenge and there it needs and the, the people there deserve and need to be helped, but that's not for this model. This is one tool. And we also, I should be, um, usually Matt Damon is out there being really clear. This is not a silver bullet, right? This is not going to solve all of the problems. It's not going to solve the entire water and sanitation crisis, but it is one really important part of an overall tool set that should be utilized when and where appropriate. So uh, this wasn't programmed, but maybe I should ask. So, um, so when you talk about Mr. Matt Damon, how convincing is that when, when you decide to, to talk uh, to, to these people in, in the field? I mean, how convincing? Oh, we don't. Uh, okay. We don't bring him, we don't bring him up in the field. I think he is a co-founder. He is very genuinely concerned, um, but these are not his ideas, right? That's why he partners, right? Okay. That's why, you know, sure. he, yeah, he wanted and cared very passionately about water and sanitation, and he did his research to decide who with, with whom he would partner, and he found Gary. Okay. Um, so, but I mean, honestly, yes, Matt Damon goes somewhere and crowds follow, you get a lot of attention. Um, and he is a wonderful spokesman. Um, and again, he cares very passionately and wants to under, and does understand the issues very thoroughly. Um, but I will also say there's a certain community at which, you know, oh, you've got a celebrity, like right. you're an organization also... headed by a celebrity. And sometimes that actually works against us. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Um, we have to fight harder have... for our legitimacy, <laughs> credibility. <laughs> Uh, I have a question also, um, someone in the chat asked, uh, well, I think um, that approximately 90% of the borrowers are, are women uh, in India, which is a very interesting uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. And it, you having lived in India and knowing quite well how things work there. Um, and, and this is basically uh, a gender inequality, which is in this case, it favors women. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on the causes for that, for, you know, for um, MFIs granting, um, you know, bar, uh, granting the, 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 the grants to, to women, actually? Sure. Um, well, so, and this is, I mean, and again, there's, yeah. So for women, um, again, it's understood that, you know, women are the ones who are going to feel this issue of having to go outside and having to collect water or going out to defecate. They're going to feel it more strongly than men um, in general, obviously not always. Um, but MFIs by and large, especially for maybe non-income generating loans, education loans or whatever, they tend to prefer lending or, or some institutions only um, lend to women. And I, I touched on this earlier, but they consider women to be much more reliable clients. If a woman takes a loan, they don't think she's going to drink it away or gamble it away. And however accurate that is or isn't, that is a very real perception. Um, so they consider women to be much more reliable. There are also in many of these countries, and especially in India, there are a lot of efforts around women's empowerment and women's economic empowerment. So there's also a lot of, I would say, um, priority put on lending to women. And within India in particular, you have MFIs, but then you also have self-help groups that engage in the similar, in the same kind of, um, in the same kind of group borrowing, where you might have a, a group of 20 women who get together every week. They're from the same village. Um, they know each other. They know where each other live. Um, they pool their resources into like one overarching fund, and then will approach a bank as a group. And this is a group lending mentality. The bank will lend to the group. It won't lend to you, Vera, or me, Leslie. It lends to the whole group of us here. And so if one of us can't make our repayment, the whole group has to cover for that person. That's great. Right? They get our and that creates a lot of social pressure to make sure that, again, because everyone, they're all neighbors, right? You can't right. miss a loan and then like skip town, you know? So there's sure. a lot of different layers in that. Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. 
Thank you, Leslie. Um, yeah. Your time, uh, well, our time is uh, our time is up. Uh, I thank you so much for uh, your presentation, for this uh, great discussion, um, and I hope to see you one day uh, in Portugal, and we can meet so. uh, in person. Um, and now I'm going to um, give the word to Manon. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie. I'm sure you uh, touched upon a lot of people in our audience today. A lot of questions were coming in in the chat, but unfortunately, uh, we are uh, um, we have only a limited time today. Thanks again, uh, and I would like now to continue uh, to our next uh, guest. Um, the next speaker on uh, today's webinar will be uh, Philippa Saldana. She is the subdirector at uh, GoBankin. Uh, in the program for sustainable development. Uh, Philippa is an economist who has dedicated her career to sustainability matters, uh, particularly in the areas of environmental economics, uh, blue economy, sustainable development, and sustainable business solutions. Before joining Gulbenkian, uh, Philippa was a financial consultant for Cotepec Portugal, where she was responsible for preparing and writing the financial analysis of the report Blue Growth for Portugal. Uh, Philippa, I would like to switch over to you. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, okay. perfect, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Catholica, for organizing such an important and forward-looking summit, and of course for the invitation. Um, I will talk today about uh, the main message that uh, result from uh, a study promoted by the Carlos Covington Foundation about uh, the water use in Portugal. Uh, important to say that this study is authored by the Consumer Intelligence Lab, which is an outstanding team that we have been the, 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 the pleasure to work with over the last year. So uh, before we, we designed uh, the study, uh, our ambition, uh, we, wanted, uh, we wanted to have a solid, a solid base of knowledge that might help us to, to activate specific, specific actions that would promote the, the transition to a more efficient and sustainable use of water in Portugal. Uh, so most specifically, we were aim to raise awareness and to mobilize different actors that could accelerate uh, sustainable water production and consumption patterns. So since uh, the agriculture sector um, represents 75% of uh, water use in Portugal, you will see that this work has a strong focus on the agro-food uh, value chain. So the, the, um, the C-Lab has performed uh, more than 1,000 questionnaires to farmers and citizens, 50-50, and also uh, 52 interviews with different uh, organizations from civil society. I'm talking about companies, business association, environmental NGOs, experts. So our results come from a solid background of information and knowledge that was retrieved specific for the purpose of this study. So today I will briefly talk because this is a giant study. It was two, study, two field studies in one one directed to the agro-food sector and the other one to the citizens. So today I will briefly talk about the 10 key messages that Kulbenkin will use in the short run to promote a sustainable use of, of water in Portugal. The first message is not a, a finding of the study, it's just a fact, uh, but is very much related to our long-term vision and understanding about the importance of building resilient societies uh, that are capable of adapting to global and environmental risks. Uh, this was, of course, re re reinforced with the current pandemic, the importance of building resilience. resilience. Um, Portugal is classified with uh, a high risk of water stress. Uh, so there is a, a huge need to anticipate scenarios of scarcity and to mitigate the risks uh, in the next two decades. So one of the key finding, finding message is that, um, can go next, please? Is that the lack of measuring of water in agriculture is delaying the transition to a sustainable use of this resource as, it as its value becomes invisible. 
um, according to the study, 71% uh, of farmers do not have water meter and 61% do not pay the water they use in agricultural practices. So there is an urgent need uh, to create the conditions to measure the use of the resource in order to man manage it efficiently. And of course, to give the farmers the tools to take advantage of uh, ongoing and future technological uh, innovations. Um, in Portugal, uh, the sector, uh, the agriculture sector is highly diverse. Uh, the study points out to four different profiles of farmers, uh, which have different approaches to sustainability and, of course, different approaches to risk and investments. So, uh, the the uh, the minority, uh, what we call the mentors, which are three percent, uh, they are very inspirational and long and have a long term view of uh, investments, uh, are highly innovative and fully integrate the value of sustainability and the value of nature in their decision-making pro process. Uh, in the other hand, in the other extreme, we have the largest segment, 38%, which, has the, which are the conditioned farmers uh, who have a very short-term uh, planning. Uh, they plan in an early basis and are, very, and are struggled by low pro profit margins. So these, these farmers are very, the, the biggest concern is about the, the prices they are paid for the production, for the production which are extremely low. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, the leaders that invest to innovate and the followers that invest for short to medium term profitability. So in the study, we can, we can find a very detailed characterization of these four segments. We don't have it time to, to, to cover everything today, but it is just for you to, to have a, a view of the diversity of the, the sector in Portugal. Um, in the next slide, we focus on technology. This is obviously a very important variable in this equation. Um, not only there is a need to accelerate technological innovation, but there is also a need to do it in an inclusive way, uh, not leaving any any farmer behind. So it is it is important to for us it will be important for us Gulbenkian to design capacity building activities that are adequate to the different profiles of farmers in Portugal. And here, techno te technical consultants, producers, organizations, uh, the mentors and the and the market leaders are, are of course key players for us to induce this positive change. Um, according to our study, irrigate, irrigated farmers, the 3%, uh, that have adopted innovative technologies like agritech can save up uh, to 50% in water consumption. Uh, according to them, they can save up between 20 to 50% in water consumption, which is a huge uh, statistic. So uh, in the next slide, yes, the transition uh, for us, the, transi the transition to a more efficient use of water in Portugal is an effort that cannot fall only to farmers, but to the entire, entire value chain. Uh, retailers uh, can be an important driving force in inducing a positive change uh, because they have a, a strong influence on both production and the consumption side. According to the study, 98% of farmers sell on the, on the national markets. So a possible solution could be to create uh, water efficiency standards in order in order to speed up the, the transition to a more sustainable food production. And actually, currently, 80%, 85% of, of consumers do not have uh, to comply with any requirements related to, to water. So, uh, this and the, and the following slides will be more directed to consumers. Um, in Portugal, although people are empathetic about the, the intrinsic value of water and the, the intrinsic value of nature, consumption behaviors still do not reflect that. Uh, water is, uh, in terms of economic incentive, water is the resource that weighs to the least in the family budget when we compare to electricity, gas, and other, and, and other important uh, items in our family budget. And 71% uh, of pe people that answered the, 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 our questionnaires question, uh, survey did not leave nor do have any memory of uh, a water shortage, sh shortage in the region. So benchmarks 
uh, and this is a trigger for us to, in the next slide, um, benchmarks can help us to design good incentives. Uh, the example of the energy efficiency, efficiency labeling is for us an incredible example of success. Uh, it is important to set new standards for the consumption of water, both in their daily behavior, but also in the adoption of equipment that allow us to save water without loss of comfort. And in the other hand, brands and, and companies um, can be uh, are powerful actors by reinforcing the message of sustainability. They are very close to consumers. So for, for Gulbenkian, this is also a, a, um, a target, a, a, a player that can have a, can guide the consumer to a more sustainable use of water. They have a strong info, a, a strong direct influence on on consumers. So, um, uh, according to the study, uh, water use is not yet a criterion in food choices. Um, historically, there have been uh, good water saving campaigns in terms of domestic use. Uh, this one is an example of Colgate. Uh, but the same is far from happening uh, in what relates to, to food choices. So for, for us, the first step could be, could be to make the consumer more aware of the weight of agriculture in the, in the water use. Um, so from this slide to the next slide, we conclude that emphasizing water in the commitment to sustainability uh, is the challenge to responsible food habits. As the consumer are empathetic about local production, production and biological production, we believe that highlighting water efficiency in the context of an environmental friendly local production uh, seems the most solid path to positive differentiation for responsible use of water. And finally, we have uh, the media. Uh, the media have an essential role in the uh, awakening of in the awakening of principles in society. Uh, new stories are needed. It would be very helpful uh, if sustainability gain editorial relevance in a consistent and continuous way over time. And along with that, water-related issues need to gain that relevance within the sustain sustainability agenda and not, for example, during dry season. So we need more uh, stories about sustainability and more stories about the water-related issues in a consistent way over time. And a powerful force tool for us is to give more voice to public influencers and mentors that are also a leading force for, for us. So the next step uh, in Gulbenkian would be to activate, um, sorry, would be to activate a strategic plan uh, that promotes uh, that can promote change in, in the entire value chain of the of the agri-food sector. So I, I, I try to be really fast. I don't know if I passed the nine minutes. Uh, um, thank you very much for for your attention. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. The the this is the first time actually that we are talking about the, this study. The study will be will be online uh, now or after my my speech uh, at in the Gulbenkian's website. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. We have a panel later that I will be moderating. So thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa. This is a great uh, uh, a great summary of the very extensive research that you have done yes. at Gulbenkian. Yes, it's a great uh, with some great insights obviously the high risk in portugal um, is one of the topics of uh, of today's and yesterday's summits uh, and it's great to see that uh, the mentors are playing a very important role uh, in in uh, guiding uh, the farmers and other um, uh, and are playing an important role in the agriculture in portugal um, and you mentioned as well the large retailers uh, uh, that have a have a huge responsibility in the water efficiency uh, which is very interesting as well as the uh, influencers that, uh, that you would uh, like to address to really make this uh, a hot topic, right? Um, I think uh, for now we can continue to our uh, panel that you will be yes. moderating and then uh, any questions uh, for either you or for the panel members can be addressed after the panel, if okay with you. Okay. Um... 
I believe the next one is, will be Jaime, Jaime Batista. Okay, good. Uh, so, these next three, uh, three speakers will give us an excellent and practical examples of challenges opportun and opportunities in the water ecosystem in Portugal. The first speaker is Jaime Batista. Jaime is currently the president of Lis Water, the, the Lisbon International Center for Water in Portugal. He is an experienced professional in the water sector with 44 years of activity dedicated to water, water supply and waste, uh, wastewater services. So, uh, Jaim, please go ahead with, uh, with your presentation and uh, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. I have not the image, I believe, but... Uh, yes, we can, we we can hear. Yes, we can hear and we can see you. Thank you. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here with you discussing those topics and the, the water topic, which is really very important. Let me say that I will speak uh, briefly about water services. Philippe spoke about water resources in, in main, uh, on agriculture. I will speak about water services. That means water supply, sanitation services. And uh, uh, we all know those services are essential essential for our well-being, for our public health and our economy. And we have big challenges ahead of us uh, regarding those services. We need to improve effectiveness of those water services. That means to achieve the targets we want to, to, uh, to we decide before to achieve. We need to improve efficiency of those uh, water services. That means make that with the minimum costs so that those services can be affordable to the consumers. Uh, improving sustainability of those services at the economic and financial point of view, infrastructure, infrastructure point of view, and also environmental point of view. And uh, we also need that those services, public essential services, can have added value for environment. Uh, can uh, have added value for our economy and can, can have added value from, from, uh, for our society uh, at large. Next slide, please. Okay, how to approach that big challenge? Well, uh, to provide water services is almost be a priority of the governance and it's a never ending process. Uh, most of the countries are far from achieving the reasonable level of services around the world. If you speak about 200 countries, most of them do not achieve the minimum targets. Uh, well, a reduced number of countries, and Portugal is in that uh, reduced number, achieved a reasonable situation on water services. But even those countries need to proceed with the uh, effort and uh, investment to achieve sustainability in a long uh, term and to face new challenges we have in this sector. So uh, I believe that we can approach and, uh, and uh, success, have success in this, in this uh, facing the, those challenges if we take care about four main areas. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The first one is that we only can expect to su succeed on water services on uh, sustainable development goal six, if we and countries, all the countries in the world, create sound public policies for water services. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, what that means, uh, sound uh, water policies? Well, uh, the countries need to promote those services. Uh, and this means a lot of initiatives, a lot of, uh, of investments, and for that, they have, the countries and governments must have a very clear view about what they want in this sector. And to implement a public policy for that sector, a specific public policy for that sector. This is the, the best and, in my view, the unique way to succeed. Because if you think about, uh, I will solve the problem of water services with money, big mistake. I will, I, I will uh, 
solve the problem with good legislation, big mistake. You need to take care about a lot of components. You see those that you have a lot of components or blocks and you need to take care about all of them. So what men means exactly a public policy? Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, public policy. You see, seems uh, something very nice, public policy, but in practice, it's a complex system. It includes the, uh, the planning of that country regarding the, those services. Uh, includes the legislation about the sector, the institutional framework of the sector, the, the, the kind of governance models to provide those services, public, private, state, municipalities, whatever. Uh, the, the service uh, assessment targets, but also the quality of service targets, the tariff and the tax policy for those services, the financial resources, construction and renovation of huge uh, infrastructures and assets uh, to, to be efficient at point of view, a structural and operational uh, point of view regarding those services. Capacity building of the professionals, research and innovation, business de development to support the water sector, introduce competition in what we, we know is a monopolistic sector, uh, protect consumers, uh, create more integrity and transparency and have sound information about the sector. So only with that uh, holistic approach, you can solve your problem. When you arrive to a country and ask the minister, can you tell me a little bit about your public policy in water sector? Uh, in many situations, what I hear uh, is it's like that. What? It's, it's broken, what that means? <laughs> what we need is not this, but next slide, please. You need those blocks. Next slide, this way. And this is a public policy. The previous one is not a public policy, okay? Next slide, please. So if we need all those components uh, uh, together, this is very important. We can say you have a good public policy, but message number two, uh, uh, regulation is essential. Regulation is one of those blocks. See, uh, in those wheels, we have the red one, which is Regulation and regulation is very important. Just one block, but that that block is very important because in practice it can control or influence all the other blocks. So it's the driver for the public policy. And what means exactly regulation? Next slide, please. Okay, regulation means that some kind of organization, a regulator, two regulators, whatever. Uh, are able and have the mandate to better organization of sector, to create sound legislation for the sector, to provide sound information of sector, to create capacity building in sector. And regarding each provider, what a provider, it can be a lot of them, in Portugal we have Surrender, for, for, for instance, that those authorities or that authority need to, 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 to make re good regulation regarding the legal and co contractual compliance, uh, the economic regulation, the quality of service, the water quality, and consumers interface regulation. So we need to have that organization be able to implement public policy with this approach. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, a third message is, okay, we have a public policy, we have good regulation, but you need sound management of water services. You need good providers. Next slide, please. Because the service is provided by utilities, and utilities as essential whole, and they must be well organized regarding or internal organization, global management, financial and administrative management, technical management, human resources, commercial management. It seems easy and obvious, but you, you can see that many of them are not able to, to guarantee that. So uh, see the results in Portugal as a policy we developed in the last 25 years. Next slide, please. We, we made that uh, since 93, a new strategy. We created a specific body, the regulator SR for that. We invest a lot of money during that period. We still invest a lot of money ev every year on management of those services. We uh, have a huge amount, even a small country, a huge amount of uh, assets. If, if you speak only about the pipes, we have 
160,000 kilometers of pipe. That means to give four times uh, around the, the, earth, uh, the, the earth, which is impressive. Small country, okay? You see the amount of assets you don't see because they are in the ground, okay? So we got a lot of success, but also some, some unsuccess, some mistakes that we need to learn with them. Next slide, please. If you see the, those, uh, the, those, you can, you can, can show all the, all the figures, please. This first one is in that period of 20, 25 years, we moved from about 80% to 95% of population connected with network. But more, uh, more impressive is on water quality for human consumption about uh, uh, speaking about the European Directive, we moved from 60%, 50% 25 years ago to almost 100% now. On, on wastewater, treated wastewater, which means the blue line, we moved from about 30% to uh, more than 80%, 85%. Regarding the impact of that, it's also impressive because uh, the impact on, on the quality of coastal basin water, water, waters, uh, we had only 58% of our beaches with good quality. Now we have almost 100%. James, and if you go... Time, Jam, sorry for interrupting. The time is, we, we reached nine minutes, so we'll ask you to... to Very briefly. Okay. To, okay. Very briefly. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so uh, even in, in, in the rivers, if you speak about the beaches in the rivers, we moved from uh, a very small uh, figure to almost uh, 100%. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, can, can you go? Uh, so we need to develop that sector, and that means to develop knowledge in that sector, but very, very important to transfer that knowledge to decision makers, to water professionals, to the industry, and to the society. What to, means we fail a lot in that transmission. We developed a lot of research, fantastic studies, but we are not able to, trans uh, to transfer that. And the last slide is this one. Next one, please. Just to say, summarizing that, that if you want to achieve those targets, you need a sound public policy. You need to introduce regulation to, to uh, promote that policy. You need to, to have a good sound management of water services with good utilities. And you need to have better and better knowledge and transfer that to all sectors. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much, Jaime. So I have a question now <laughs> to Catholica. Should I? Should we ask the questions now or after the three panels? You can do it after the three panels. After. Yes, after, okay. after our presentation. So now we have uh, Nuno Broco. Nuno is the head of engineering department at Agus Portugal. Nuno has more than uh, 20 years of professional experience where we should highlight the field of turnkey contacts for the design, supply, assembly, and startup of water and wastewater treatment plants on public and industrial sectors. He, he, he brings today a very important topic in uh, tackling, cli tackling climate change and building resilience. So please go ahead, Nun, and thank you. Hello, Flipa. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very okay, well. per perfect. Say hello also to Jaime and to Maria as well that uh, belongs to this panel and uh, uh, congratulate uh, Catholica for this event and also uh, to, to, to acknowledge the, the, the invitation that um, Catholica have uh, made to ADP to share with, uh, with uh, this, uh, this uh, summit uh, our experience in this, in this topic. Well, since next slide, please. Can you take off the sound, please? Okay. Um, since uh, the audience is, uh, is, is, is uh, more or less diverse in terms of uh, professionals, oops, can you mute? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to present uh, ADP in a brief. Um, since uh, since uh, um, uh, part of you don't know ADP, I would like to, to give a brief introduction to our group. We are a public uh, group, a national uh, utility. Uh, we supply water and treat wastewater to around 80% of the national uh, Portuguese population. And uh, we operate in Portugal through uh, 14 companies. Today we are 14 companies. Uh, may, uh, the most part of them are concession contracts, so long-term concession contracts. 
and uh, we also operate uh, a little bit worldwide providing technical assistance to other governments, uh, regulators and also other utilities. So these are our uh, main figures uh, from ADP. Thank you for share for for the next slide and uh, uh, we heard these last days uh, a lot about the importance of water jim and flip told us a little bit about that um, for us uh, water is our core business and uh, 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 we have started to uh, build our resilience pathway um, some years ago indeed uh, ADP Group starts have been uh, created 25 years ago to increase the resilience of the water services in Portugal. Jaime explained a little bit that. And uh, we had a uh, first period of a very important investment. Um, after this initial period, period of a, a very powerful investment, we have started to look a little bit ahead and uh, develop our resilience, not only by the GRI uh, investments, but also uh, using other uh, type of measures to increase our resilience. And uh, when we talk about resilience, first in the first moment, I think that we should talk about being efficient. And this, is, uh, this should be a core um, concern of our uh, companies. Then planning to uh, increase the resilience of an utility. Uh, it is very important to uh, work at strategic planning and also at operational uh, planning. Regulators are essential to help us and to uh, increase our resilience. Uh, you know that we operate on the contract, uh, concession contracts. All our investments are approved by the regulator. So it is very important to uh, engage the regulator, either the environmental, either the economic regulator in this pathway. Then the capacity to finance the investments and uh, last but not least, soft measures. It is very, very important from our point of view that the resilience is not, uh, is not seen uh, only by doing new pipes, new dams, new water treatment plants. We need to have a set of uh, soft measures like communication, stakeholders engagement and innovation to perform this uh, resilience. Next slide, please. Well, uh, talking about being efficient, I bring you uh, an example of uh, one of uh, ADP uh, companies, Epald, it is the oldest company in ADP group that have made an amazing work regarding the non-revenue water reduction. And during the last 80 years, they have reduced the uh, water losses in Lisbon from 24% to around 8%. This is a, a, a very impressive work. You know that the national average is around 30% on non-revenue water. And Lisbon is today one of the most efficient uh, cities on the world regarding non-revenue water. Can you put the, the film, please? Everyone knows that water is essential to life. Everyone knows that water is a limited resource. Everyone knows that too much water is wasted. But how much? 10, 15, 25%? At the present day, 50% of all the water entering into the worldwide distribution networks is lost. But do you know those situations where everybody wins? Usually they're called win-win situations. We call them one. One, water optimization for network efficiency is a network management and control of water loss system that develops in five steps. Installing district meter areas throughout the supply network, dividing it into sub areas, continuous monitoring of each area, planning and executing interventions of leak detection, sending the repair teams. The whole process happens with the support of a software application that automatically brings together all relevant network monitoring data. Lisbon, one of the most efficient capitals in the world in terms of water use, was the first city to apply one. Next slide, please. Well, uh, we have started uh, 
in 2015 our strategic plan for climate change adaptation and when i talk about climate change adaptation i'm not only talk about water scarcity but i will focus this presentation on water scarcity we have developed at the first stage a global approach for all uh, operational companies and in the second phase we have uh, built uh, operational adaptation plans for each company means that uh, each company has their own uh, operational plan for uh, climate change adaptation and we are doing this in a very uh, progressive uh, phase so uh, we are not performing all our investments at the same moment in the beginning we are measuring the risk we are monitoring the risk and we implement the measures when we see that it's necessary next slide please we are working at uh, different pillars. We are working at uh, water storage, and I bring you an example of uh, Algarve, um, uh, one of the Algarve investments that we have made in the last decade. It uh, was the Odloca Dam. We are working on the reuse of the wastewater, and we are, uh, we are also work making interconnection between uh, uh, public uh, uh, water uh, infrastructures and infrastructures that are used on uh, irrigation on agriculture. Uh, we are uh, working very deeply with EDEA, that is the, main, uh, the manager of the big Alkeva Dam, uh, connecting uh, uh, infrastructures, using infrastructures uh, in order to increase the resiliency of our systems. Next slide, please. We are wor also working in uh, innovation and uh, Philippe told us about the need to create awareness uh, in uh, the agriculture sector. This is a good example of what we are doing in this moment. We are using the sun, the, the, the solar energy, to increase the quality of our treated wastewater. And we are putting that wastewater in the irrigation of uh, uh, trees, fruit trees. Um, and this is a very interesting project because we are promoting circular economy to a renewable uh, energy uh, source. And we are, with the farmer, uh, uh, monitoring the added value of used wastewater, treated wastewater, instead of raw water. Because some of uh, the nutrients that, goes, that comes out from the, our plants with the treated wastewater are an added value for the, 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 the crops. Next slide, please. Well, telling this, we see uh, a new paradigm for the, the water management. Uh, and this case of uh, Alentejo is a very good example. We are integrating our infrastructures. We are sharing information that are very important to share information with the, the, the farmers. We have their engagement. It's very important. We are exploring new water sources and we are creating awareness on, on, this, uh, on this region. For the uh, last slide, please. So, for us, uh, build the resilience is taking care of these partnerships. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, we'll be, as an utility, much more uh, resilient uh, as we can uh, go through these partnerships and involving not only the agriculture, also the industry, other uh, water utilities but also the regulators and uh, most important, probably the citizens. So I'll be free for any questions. Thank you very much, Nuno. Um, now we have, um, okay. Now we have Maria João Rosa. Uh, Maria João is currently a, a senior researcher at LMEC. Uh, the head of the urban water unit and of the water quality treatment and re reuse laboratory. Uh, during her vast professional experience, Maria João has led more than 30 water related projects and participate in another 21. Uh, today, Maria João will share with us the, water, uh, the urban water challenge and innovation in what relates to efficiency and reuse. So please go ahead, Maria João. Thank you. Um, I Good afternoon. Uh, many thanks, Philippe, for the kind introduction and uh, hi to you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Many thanks to Nuni and to, to Katolika for inviting Elnek and, and myself 
it's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share some of our projects on water efficiency and reuse, and also, of course, to learn from you. Um, I'm uh, from the, the um, so starting with the with the urban water challenges, many much have been said already, but uh, we have to cope with more demanding requirements every day regarding public health, public safety. See what's going on with the pand with the COVID pandemic. Uh, also, circular economy and resource efficiency, it's a, it's a challenge. Infrastructure asset management, we have to keep the legacy of, uh, throughout the generations. Um, climate dynamics is driving natural hazards that we have to cope with, including water scarcity. And of course, we have to work together and collaborative processes are needed everywhere, and particularly to boost what we need in Europe, which is new, the green economy and reindustrialization. Uh, next, please. So in the our urban water unit of um, the hydrology and environment department at Delnec has four um, pillars uh, as research and development and innovation areas, uh, starting with strategic asset management, um, water uh, and energy, water quality treatment and reuse, and reliability, safety, and resilience. And we develop these for um, research areas uh, with um, uh, mostly um, through peer-to-peer -peer innovation projects with water utilities. We want to work with the, those who have the problems, not for them. And uh, these, uh, the last years we have been, uh, these are some examples, the numbers and of the peer-to-peer -peer innovation projects which come up to more than 170 utilities, many from the AD group. And today I will also briefly, we'll have a glance can you come to the formal previous one, please? Um, just uh, a glance on these on these highlighted projects and also on some new um, European project on reuse. Next, please. So starting with the pair, the pair that it's a water losses and energy management in water supply systems project. Um, not much different from one that shown that it was shown by ADP, but uh, what we do here, we have a software, a tool to assess water losses in system uh, energy efficiency based on water and energy balances. Uh, we diagnose the performance and, and develop the decision support. We support the decision on the, which measures to implement. Um, we have more. We have uh, more than thirty water utilities with plans to re to want to increase their efficiency, and this translates in overall twenty percent water loss, real water losses reduction, and sixty uh, percent energy uh, savings. And but the thing that we have, we go. Um, our our difference in this approach is that we look into the the system um, as a whole. We analyze the system. So, for instance, this example clearly shows that we are using three pumping stations to to elevate the water, and then we have a downstream pressure reduction. So we are pumping then to reduce the pressure. And next, please. And uh, if the, 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 the energy auditing, uh, 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 the traditional approach is to audit the pumping station, we go further. Next, please. Next slide, please. And we do, uh, uh, we, we, sorry, previous one. <laughs> and uh, we look into the, to the layout to eliminate what the pumps that are not needed and to direct support, uh, supply the water to, uh, to the elevation that it's needed. So we, we, in this way, we can save a lot of energy and also to, to, to control the, the water losses. Now, next, please. And uh, what is, next slide, please. Water supply, oops, water supply systems is very important in the urban water cycle, but it's not the only component. We have to look into all the other things like drainage of wastewater, treatment of water, treatment of wastewater, reuse. And to do that, we have to go to, to have a broad approach. And that's what we are developing in the Valier Maish uh, project, um, which gathers 13 water utilities and uh, uh, two research partners, LNEC and IST and we are working on the energy efficiency. But uh, what we have learned and developed for the urban water systems can also be uh, fully applied uh, with the adaptations, of course, uh, to, to the uh, collective irrigation systems. As Felipe has told, uh, agriculture is a key uh, consumer of water and there's much to do. Um, the, the, the irrigation systems lack efficiency, um, um the, the energy consumption almost uh, 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 it's almost 10 times uh, higher in the last uh, 
60 years and the, the, the irrigation systems are in poor condition, mostly and, and are labor intensive. So what we are focusing here in this project with the, all the, the partners that you can see below is uh, to, to, to improve the efficiency, the water and energy efficiency when it comes uh, uh, from the water reservoir until the, the, the irrigated plot. Um, and uh, we use the, the kind of the same methodologies um, that we used previously, and we expect to, 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 to uh, yield savings of, of above 20%. Next, please. Uh, in terms of, of, of wastewater treatment, which is really uh, another uh, big slice of the, of the urban water cycle, um, we are, for instance, we are developing now uh, an initiative on energy water quality and treatment uh, involving several areas, uh, mostly benchmarking the performance of several wastewater treatment plants and also to have a different approach on, on infrastructure asset management. For instance, in terms of energy efficiency in wastewater treatment, we are uh, 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 achieving uh, up to or even more 20% reduction only in aeration, which is really important. But what I would like to, to, to highlight today is that we are now in, in introducing uh, a thing that is rethink treatment with asset management. So we, we no longer uh, are allowed it to, to replace uh, an asset by uh, the, exactly the same asset in, as new, but we have to, to analyze the functional obsolescence. Since, for instance, in treatment, the, 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 the water quality discharge increases, so we have to, the, the treatment has to follow the, the, the um, dose changes. And we do this to prepare the wastewater treatment plants for water reuse, for circular economy, for controlling contaminants of emerging concern. So ultimately to have climate change proof plants. Next, please. Uh, and in this topic, we are all, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to announce that the, next year we will be having uh, uh, in, in, in Porto uh, uh, um, uh, an IWA, so a conference from the International Water Association exactly on um, on uh, uh, rethinking treatment with asset management. And next, please. Moving into water reuse. Uh, we know that water reuse is very pretty much about uh, uh, trust and safety of the of the reuse. Uh, and technology is also uh, it's sometimes seen as a, as a barrier, but really we have technology to do whatever we want. For instance, we can um, we can uh, um, use and we, we exactly with one of the companies of, of ADP, uh, we have been uh, um, uh, developing a, a pilot demonstration so 24/7 of an advanced treatment of ceramic microfiltration to produce water for unrestricted, unrestricted uh, urban water use. This means with no bacterial biological hazards, such as uh, those, uh, uh, as you can see here in the, the we have no E. coli as, uh, at all. And uh, it's also, it's also very, very, it's always very important to know what, at, at how cost, uh, how costly are these processes. And that's why we also uh, develop cost analysis. But uh, this is our, uh, one example in Portugal. We have others, for instance, in Barcelona, with Aguas Barcelona and Setacqua, we developed a process uh, of innovative hybrid systems to promote water reuse, including many other technological options that I will not, I do not have the time to share with you, but next time perhaps. So next slide, please. Uh, and we can all, um, uh, water reuse uh, uh, some years ago was really limited by the, by, by, by regulation, uh, connecting with the James uh, conversation. And uh, we, had, we, had, we identified that and 10 years ago, we, we started with a small group of countries, uh, these um, uh, technical committee, these ISO technical committee on water reuse. So to gather the best knowledge and to get the cons and, and a world consensus around what, we sh what should be done in water reuse. Um, and uh, we have already, sorry, can you go backward? Okay. So by now we have 17 uh, uh, standards developed, many others under development. And really what the important thing is that we introduce the fit for purpose concept, a multi barriers approach and risk assessment and management as the three key success factors for uh, um, um, a safe uh, water reuse project. Next, please. Dear Juan, one minute, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm just, uh, just I'm just, you know. yeah, yeah, I'm just finishing. 
So, and this this uh, uh, worthy ground for developing the legal framework that we have now in Portugal and Europe. Uh, these standards were used by the 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 decree law, the, the Portuguese decree law that was published last year, and the the the, the, real, the new regulation that was published last month. Um, can you move next pl slide, please? So the key message on water reuse is that uh, I think it's uh, you should see water reuse not as an end objective, but as a way towards the sustainable water um, uh, management. And uh, it should be framed with all the agendas that we have. It's all about safety and trust. So sharing the good things and not the so good things, it's important. Innovation in engineering, but also in social and economic and really long-term planning and strategies are mandatory as well as we have to improve on fair and sustainable water pricing and i'm i'm, I'm highlighting these because we are here with the, in this forum uh, just to uh, a glance on in the future we are now uh, starting a new a big project the european project on horizon 2020 be water smart which will go into uh, water smart uh, societies and economies with many other uh, with many Portuguese partners as well. And thank you very much. I'm open to, to, to questions after Philippa opens the, the debate. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you very much to these three excellent and very constructive and uh, uh, practical presentation with good examples. Uh, we don't have uh, much time, but uh, I would like to, because we don't want to delay the next panel, but I would like to make to do uh, uh, one question <coughs> to each one of you. Uh, so I will follow the same order of the presentation. Jaim, but I will just ask you to be, to be straight to the point in, the, in your answers. Um, Jaima, uh, we have a question that uh, a very interesting question. Uh, how can Portugal uh, reinforce the interna internationalization of its companies in the water sector? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, uh, I, I do believe that Portugal is a, in a very good position to increase interna uh, international activities. Why? Because we did in those 25 years a uh, fantastic process of improving those services. So we know how to do that, how to do that, uh, how to implement policy, regulation, and uh, management. And we can transfer that knowledge to many other countries. What uh, happens in some uh, situations, for sure, but I do believe the secret will be to combine the traditional approach bottom up where the Portuguese companies try, try to go to uh, foreign markets and try to compete with others for offering those services with a second approach with a top-down approach from government uh, through exactly the public policies and regulation which is a topic state by, uh, to state uh, connection uh, where the foreign affairs ministry can make a strong effort so that the, the Portuguese diplomacy can find opportunities so that Portugal help other countries creating a good sound public policies, regulation and management. And for sure, with that first approach, it will be much more easy to the Portuguese companies to do all the other components, all the other detailed studies and so on. That's my, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very very good good answer and thank you for we hope that could happen in the in the short to to medium run uh, nunu um uh, we my question now it's more related to adp group uh, more specific uh, what are the plans of the group to to address the government guidance on measures to increase wastewater reuse in the country's 50 largest wastewater treatment uh, that is 10% in 25 and 20% in 2030. Okay, th thank you for the question. Um, well, I'll just give you a figure uh, today, and uh, uh, today the, the, the current numbers on uh, wastewater reuse in Portugal is around 1% of the total 
uh, wastewater that is treated in our country. So we have a long, long way to, 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 to tackle. And uh, we are working on that. We have uh, ADP group have uh, already started the action plan uh, once again in two stages. The first with uh, some common methodologies and some, some common approaches for all companies. And then each company is working on their own action plan. Of course, the situation from Algarve is different from the north of the country. And we are working with uh, in several uh, different uh, pillars. Uh, of course, some of them depends only from our side, uh, trying to get the partnership with the industry, with the golf courses, with the farmers. But Philippa, you and in your first presentation told us about the number of farmers that don't pay anything for the water that they use. So. You can imagine that uh, it is a very difficult and long way and some of the measures that you uh, explain in your presentation will be very welcome for to help us uh, for this uh, to achieve this these numbers thank you thank you very much and very ambitious targets and of course the gulbenkian is always uh, open to to to, to partner with the important players in Portugal uh, as, uh, in the way to, 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 to accelerate the transition to more responsible and, uh, and uh, sustainable future. So Maria João, now it's the, your time. Um, what are the real drivers and success factors for water and energy efficiency and water reuse, in your opinion? Thank you, Pripa. Uh, well, I would say that for uh, um, water energy efficiency, I think it's money, climate, nature. It's 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 easy to understand. Uh, we have uh, all the, the the resource efficiency that we have to promote, and by doing that, we have cash. We 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 can pay back the investments because we are saving water and energy. When it comes to water reuse, it's I think it's more tricky. And I would say, in the kind of since it's Friday afternoon, we are almost living on 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 holiday on uh, on uh, weekend. I would say that um, the driver is definitely water scarcity, but the enablers are trust and memory. And what uh, what do I what do I mean by that? We need trust, so we need to trust the water that we are reusing, and to do that, we need to have really sound risk assessment and management. And in this management, we have to include the right technology. Not, not more, not less than we need for the given purpose of, that we are going to use the water. We have to have effective communication amongst all stakeholders um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the water cycle. And, and here, as, as uh, um, some of you have already pointed out, the young people will have a key play to role. So they, it's, I think it will be easy to engage, uh, learning from what's going on in my home, I think they will be uh, willing to, 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 to catalyze this change and memory. I think we need to have memory to put this, um, this water reuse project forward. We, have, we, we know to remember during the wet uh, years that there are dry years, uh, a certain and more and more, it, I, I'm saying the thing, almost the same that you have already said. So we have to, 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 to have long-term long, long -term planning. So to remember that there are some years that will be dry and we'll have to have reliable uh, alternative source and the water use it's the most reliable because wherever and whenever there's water consumption we will have water to reclaim and to reuse and uh, and ultimately we need to have policies and now we are be much better this year for, since last year and we have to now we have to move forward the, the economic and the incentives and how to pay these 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 projects and the water pricing is really a challenge, and I challenge Catholica to 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 invest on this topic. And I think it's it. Yeah, memory policies, technology, communication. Very excellent, excellent answer, Brijuan. Thank you very much to to everyone, and special to the 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 three speakers that have a, that have a very uh, impressive presentation with good orientations. Uh, I would love to continue this discussion because we of course have much more questions but uh, the time that the other panel started at 45 it's 53 already so we don't want to delay them. 
uh, good luck for the next panel. Thank you all. Thank you, Catholica, for the invitation and uh, good luck for the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa, for moder moderating this panel. Very interesting insights indeed. Um, I would now like to continue to the next, um, oh, sorry, before we continue to the next track, I would like to uh, have one poll like we did yesterday after this panel and after the next panel, we will have a poll to uh, ask your opinion on um, the following question. How serious do you consider the issue of water scarcity in Portugal to be? One being uh, not at all and seven being uh, very much. So please go ahead and vote the answer that suits you best. Great, votes are coming in. I'll give you a few more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. All right, thank you so much. Uh, as we can see here in the results, uh, most of you consider it uh, uh, very much to be of an issue or at least uh, a, a very high issue. Um, I would now like uh, to continue with, uh, with the last track of this conference, um, water in the value chain, the consumption part. Uh, this panel will be moderated by my colleague Vera. Uh, so I would like now to give the floor to Vera. Thank you, Manon. Thank you so much. Um, so um, hello and welcome to the consumption panel. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to this panel about the role of water in consumption within the value chain. In this panel, we will listen to four speakers who are representing well-known brands from beverages to tourism and retail, and who bring us examples of how they embrace the issue of water within their business operations, but also how the consumer perspective is taken into account so that more sustainable behaviors uh, can be achieved. Our first speaker um, is Miguel Monteiro, who is the Chief Operating Officer from L'Oréal, who I'm sure you all recognize as one of the leading brands in the beauty care business around the world. Miguel has a vast experience in operations, fast moving consumer goods, supply chain optimization, demand planning, procurement, and warehouse management. Eight years ago, Miguel embraced an expatriation journey in France that culminated in the, in the position of supply chain director for the new markets business unit within Africa and the Middle East. And in 2019, Miguel took over the position of CEO, COO for L'Oréal uh, Portugal and was nominated local sustainability program leader this last April. Um, Miguel, it's a pleasure to have you um, with us. Um, let's uh, let's uh, move then to your presentation. I hope you have uh, a few slides um, to show us. Okay, so I have to... Okay, so just to be sure everything okay. I think it's good. So um, thank you very much, uh, Vera, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, it's really a pleasure for me and for L'Oreal to be part of this summit today. It's full screen. So uh, we will start with a short video about L'Oreal.
Right, so talking about sustainability. Actually, uh, sustainability is not a new topic for, for L'Oreal. Uh, since the 90s and throughout uh, different programs, L'Oreal has already been uh, working on the environmental and social toll impact of its business. Sharing with you with all uh, is our latest program and the most uh, emblematic so far. This program was, um, was built around four main uh, axes, let's say like that. The first one is innovating uh, sustainably. That means changing our formulas uh, to reduce the footprint of our products. It means um, improving our packaging. It means adopting sustainable sourcing policies for raw materials. The second one is producing sustainably by improving our industrial performance. That means reducing CO2 emissions, uh, reducing water consumption, generating uh, less waste. Then we have living sustainably by helping people from underprivileged uh, communities to have access to work or empowering our consumers to make sustainable choices. Finally, developing uh, sustainably by onboarding our internal and external uh, stakeholders and including our strategic suppliers in the sustainability roadmap. So if we look now a bit more in detail into water, Water is a, is a vital resource, but not all, all people in the world have access to it. Furthermore, there are huge inequalities amongst countries. As Philippe Sancho, Dean of Catholic Lisbon, uh, said yesterday, there is a triple paradox with water. It is scarce, but at the same time, it's cheap. As it's cheap, it is wasted. So what about L'Oreal? For L'Oreal, water is essential. So, Sorry. So to put it simple, no water, no business. But you may ask, where does L'Oreal use its water? Well, first we use it as a raw material. Actually, water is the main component of our products. To give you an idea, a normal shampoo contains on average 80% of water. In some cases, it can go up. Okay, sorry, that was an issue. In some cases, it can go up to 95%. We also use water in our manufacturing processes for cooling or for cleaning our equipment. Our employees use water for showers, for in toilets, etc. Last but surely not least, water is used by our consumers as they use our personal care products. Just to give you some metrics on what we have been able to achieve. From 2005 till 2019, we have reduced, we managed to reduce by 51% our total water intensity. Our target for this year is to reach minus six, uh, 60%. Actually, if we do not consider the water contained in our products, we are already at uh, minus 60%. We also have four water loop factories. In a few minutes, I'll explain what is a water loop factory. So that said, what exactly is L'Oreal doing? Well, from a consumer perspective, we are developing new products and new formulas. For instance, we are launching solid or bar shampoos. We are working on concentrated formulas. All these to reduce the amount of water existing in our products. To give you an idea, as I said before, a normal shampoo contains on average 80% of water. A solid shampoo, however, is completely water-free. We are also investing uh, in new technologies and promoting new behaviors that reduce, that help reduce uh, water usage. We are developing rinseless formulas. We are collaborating with Gyoza Startup to create an innovative uh, hair wash system that uses five times less water. In parallel, and from an operation standpoint, we are optimizing the water consumption in our factories by changing our manufacturing processes. I don't know why I have this. We are also implementing water loop factories. A water loop factory is a factory where 100% of the water used for industrial processes is clean and recycled in a closed loop on site so that it can be used again. And we are also looking at the whole um, value chain, um, assessing 
the water policies and the water consumption of our strategic players. With all these uh, actions, we actually managed to decouple. We, are, we actually managed uh, to decouple um, growth from uh, environmental impacts. As you can see, from 2005 till 2019, we increased by 37% the number of units we produce in a year, while decreasing by 33% our water usage, in this case, cubic meters. I would like now uh, to present you our new sustainability program that will replace sharing between all. It is L'Oreal for the future. With this program, L'Oreal wants um, to raise its sustainability ambition to the next level and is engaging with even more ambitious targets for the next decade. Just to mention a few, we aim to reach carbon neutrality by 2025. We want to cut by half our carbon emissions. We want to use 100% renewables and ensure all plastic packaging comes from recycled and or bio-based sources. This program has been unveiled by L'Oreal just yesterday in France, and we are doing for the rest of the world today. Unfortunately, I won't have time to detail all the ambitions of the program, so I finish my presentation with the ones related to water. So by 2030, L'Oreal commits to have as a strategic suppliers only companies that hold a responsible usage of water. Reduce by 25% the water our consumers spend when using our products. Transform all our 44 factories in the world into water loop factories and have all our formulas respecting the aquatic environment. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Miguel. Thank you so much for your enlightening presentation. Um, I will now move to um, Pedro Lopes and uh, Pedro uh, Lopes. It's, it's a pleasure to have you um, on board. Um, uh, Pedro Lopes is a board member at the Pristana Group, a leading hotel and resorts chain group with over 90 hotels in Portugal and abroad, including the Posadas de Portugal. Pedro Lopes is based in the Algarve region and under his supervision is the direct management of seven hotels and five golf courses in the region. He's also the vice president for the Regional uh, Hotel and Tourism Association, president of the Portimao Tourism Association, as well as the chairman of the board of directors for the Regional Development Agency, a public pri private partnership between five major municipalities of the Algarve region and uh, major private uh, companies in the area. Um, Pedro, uh, it is a pleasure. Um, and now uh, we will listen to your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Nuno, for uh, inviting Pristana Hotel Group to participate in this Water Summit organized by Catholic University, where I did my graduation uh, a few years ago. So I, I, I will be quick. I will speak about two ongoing projects we, have, we are doing in this moment in Algarve. Anyway, we are doing this kind of projects because we are concerned with the region trend to dry climates. So the, the first project, we, we, I'll speak a little, will be about, about water reuse from a wastewater treatment plant into two of, of our existing golf courses. And second project, the modernization of our desalination plant in Alvor Beach. Next, please. So, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Vera already said, we, are, uh, we have hotels all, all, over, all over around the world. In Algarve, in Algarve region, we have, we have a very strong presence with nine hotel units, three Posadas de Portugal, historic hotels, five Pistana resident resorts, and five golf courses. Next, please. First, I will speak a little about water in Algarve. Algarve region, it uses uh, about 227 million uh, square uh, meters of water. Uh, agriculture uses 60%, human consumption is 33% of the total, golf 5% and other industries 2%. So golf, this 5% means uh, the, the use of about 40 golf courses which uh, uh, generates about half a billion of cross valid added, and which uh, means uh, about uh, to almost 23,000 employments, direct and, 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 and direct. It's a very important um, activity for tourism in Algarve because it's major uh, uh, low season activity. 
uh, it's very well known and very uh, outside Portugal. And we are in this activity in the last few years, we win a lot of prizes, like for example, already this year, 2020, award of the International Association of Golf and Tour Operators, the World Golf Destination of the Year. Next, please. Thank you. So uh, this action we are now doing is uh, uh, we, need, we want to use the treated wastewater water from Boa Vista plant uh, to irrigate two of our golf courses, Gramacho and Valda Pinta. This wastewater treatment plant is operated by Águas do Algarve, which is, uh, belongs to Águas Portugal Group. Our main goals in this action are, first, to diversify the sources of water supply, second, to reduce the dependence of rainfall in a region with future trend to dry climates, and third, to reduce the actual usage of silge dam water, freeing it up for use by other consumers like the agriculture. This dam is not uh, for human consumption. Next, please. So, in this photo, you can see our two golf courses, Gramacho and Valde Pinta. Uh, in, the, in the up corner of our beach, I will speak later about the desalination plant. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, Boa Vista wastewater treatment plant is in the left uh, back corner. Next, please. So, in this moment, these two golf courses, Gramacho and Val de, de Pinta, uh, have a water consumption of about 700,000 uh, square meters of water per year. And in this moment, uh, Boa Vista wa wastewater treatment plants uh, have an effluent discharge of about the same size. These actions uh, to be developed are, are basically in this moment three. First, to do the characterization of the actual situation. Second, we have to develop the risk assessment associated with the use of the water in the, in the irrigation of the two golf courses. And third, we have to do the definition and implementation of the additional water treatment measures to increase the water quality before its use in the irrigation system of the, these two golf courses. Our partner in this action is the LNEC, the Laboratoire de Genie Civil from Lisbon, the Urban Water Unit, ran a very nice team of specialists run by uh, Engineer Maria João Rosa, who was in the previous panel of this summit. Next, please. So, the second uh, ongoing project I want to speak a little about is, uh, is, the, the, is about the, our desalination plant we have in Alvor, in the right up corner on, of the same future. So, of course, is in Alvor Beach uh, is very close, uh, are very close, about uh, about 10 to 15 kilometers. So this uh, uh, reverse osmosis desalination plant uh, worked since, uh, since 2080 until 2015, uh, where, where it stopped. The total investment cost was about 1 million and 100,000 years, uh, euros for, sorry, for the plant, for the equipment installation and the, for the pipeline network between the hotels. Now, its modernization process will cost us about half a million. Uh, in this moment, I, we are in negotiation with Agos do Algarve in order to achieve a partnership to run this project. The main goals here are very similar to, to, to the ones of the other project. Is to first, to dif diversify the water sources to reduce the risk associated with water scarcity in dry years. Second, to increase the sustainability of our hotel units by consuming much, much less water from public supply system, freeing it up for use by other consumers. And third, to reduce the dependence of the public network. It means to take advantage of the abundance of regions, natural resource, seawater. Next, please. So, in our beach area, in, in, in this beach, we have uh, seven hotel units with about 1,400 rooms, and our concern per year of water is about 270,000 square meters of water. This is three photos of three of seven hotels we have around. Next, please. 
So in the left side, you have a photo of this, this, uh, uh, this beach and uh, the hotels and we have around. In this orange square is the right hand photo. On upper part of the right hand photo, uh, you can see the, the, the simulation plants. And also a little down, you can see four hills. We have two groundwater hills to get the seawater to the desinalization plants. And you, we have also two rejection wheels to send 60% of the water back to the ocean. Next, please. Thank you, Manon. So uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, water desinalization plants has a recovery factor of 40%. Has a rejection factor of 60%. It means that 60% of the water goes back to the ocean, can operate 24 hours a day, and a, a maximum of about 355 days per year. It means a maximum production of 280,000 square meters per year, which is, it means about all the consumption of water we have in these three, in these seven hotel units. Where you do, where, what we do there? First, first we do the water catchment by the, that true wheels I showed you before. After it, we do the pretreatments. Third, we do the desinalization by reverse osmosis. Last, we do the mineralization of, of the water. After it, the 40% of the water we, we uh, catch from the ocean can be used, uh, is, is ready to use in our seven hotels in the area. So thank you for listening to me for these uh, minutes and uh, I'm here to thank you and I am here to answer all these, these questions you, you want. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro. Uh, it's, it's, it makes us uh, wanting to go <laughs> for, the, for the weekend uh, to the Algarve. But before that, hang in there. Uh, we, have, um, we have two more uh, presentations and we have one more panel. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Fernando Ventura, Head of Efficiency and Innovation Environmental Projects at the Geroni Martins Group, a reference within the food distribution and specialized retail that operates more than 4,400 stores in Portugal, Poland and Colombia, including the, uh, the Pingu Dos chain, to, chain of supermarkets and hypermarkets. Fernando has over 25 years experience uh, working in the public and the private sector in the fields of environmental management and sustainability, leading projects that foster natural resources, efficiency and eco innovation, such as food waste and the eco design of packaging. Um, where are you? I need to admit you, uh, Fernando, one second. I'm uh, sorry, oh, it's for you. I'm already here. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much Fer, for the introduction and thank you also for the invitation for uh, being here today and sharing uh, some of our cases. Um, so, uh, and before I share those, uh, those cases related to a, a more sustainable water consumption, uh, let me start by presenting you Pink Dose for the ones that don't know it already. So next slide, please. And perhaps the next one too, please. You can skip this one. Okay, th so those are some um, key figures uh, for Pingdos uh, achievements uh, of 2019. Uh, I just would like to highlight that uh, Pingdos uh, uh, has been a, a supermarket leader in Portugal for 40 years now. And um, that uh, biodiversity, it's one of uh, its uh, response, social responsibility uh, priorities. And uh, uh, so, um, can we move to the next slide, please? So, uh, and which solutions has Pingdos been um, uh, providing to, to its uh, customers? Uh, next one, please. And in order to promote uh, a more, sus more sustainable practices uh, at consumption level. So today I will be focused, of course, on, on the consumption phase uh, of, the, of the value chain. But nevertheless, before that, and to give you an overview of uh, our approach uh, in terms of sustainability, we always consider the entire value chain uh, when developing new solutions. 
So uh, this means that uh, uh, the one before this, <laughs> this means that uh, when we are exploring new ideas for a specific uh, phase of the value chain, of course, uh, we need to look to uh, environmental and eventually other impacts at all stages. Otherwise, we can face uh, higher negative impacts when implementing those, uh, those solutions, of course. Uh, and so from a more practical point of view and for the consumption phase, let me show you uh, some, some, some cases. So next slide, please. And, uh, and let me start with our private brand detergents with uh, European, uh, European Eco Label. So those detergents, uh, they present reduced toxicity when compared to the most uh, uh, common ones with the average product uh, that we already uh, that we also sell them in our in our shelves. Um, and these um, and by providing the solution, we are not uh, changing consumption itself, but. Uh, Rather, we are providing a solution that allows consumers to reduce their impact, impact on water body, bodies. Uh, these in terms of water quality of those water bodies and also and thus, uh, on, the, on the life that they contain. Uh, next slide, please. So another, another example is our packaging eco-design project. Um, and in fact, we have joined the new plastics economy global commitment uh, last January. And those are two of the commitments that we have public, uh, public um, uh, disclosed. Uh, so we want to achieve by 2025, 100% of recyclable packaging and 25% of recycled content also in plastic packaging. So those two and the other commitments that we have assumed recently, they are uh, quite uh, connected with the, with the water pollution. Uh, and so it's our contribution, let's say, uh, to reduce marine pollution among other, uh, other goals. Uh, and so um, our packaging eco-design is not only focused on plastic, uh, it's focused uh, on all materials as a whole. Uh, and since 2011, we changed or we re redes redesigned almost 300 products uh, with several uh, benefits in terms of material savings and CO2 savings also because we are being more efficient in transportation. And perhaps this example uh, can um, show the benefits uh, of the packaging eco-design in marine pollution. Uh, so this bottle that you can see of this detergent is made of 100% recycled plastic, being 11% from marine recovered from marine litter and 89% of post-consumer. Uh, so, um, but it is 100% recycled and also, of course, easy to recycle. So uh, per year, this, only this product saves more than 700 tons uh, of uh, virgin plastic. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of single-use plastics, two of the most common single-use plastics uh, that we can find in European uh, beaches are cotton buds and plastic straws. So they are in the top 10 of those single-use plastics. Uh, and our commitment and those, those single-use plastics are targeted by the European Union to be banned uh, in one year. Uh, what we have done was anticipating uh, these legal requirements. So our, our, our um, uh, cotton bands are made of uh, only of uh, paper since January last year. And our plastic, our um, straws in milk products are also only made of paper and they only use paper fibers. So they don't use, before you ask me that later on, they don't use plastic layers because by using plastic layers, uh, uh, they are not seen as an alternative uh, by the European Commission. Next slide, please. Uh, and so before um, I end my presentation, I have also this, this, uh, this case. Um, so 
in 2018 in partnership uh, with Purify Echo, we developed uh, um, those um, refilling stations in our own stores. So we are moving from bottled water to uh, tap water that we treat in those stations uh, and we sell in reusable boxes, uh, reusable um, bottles to our to our own consumers, to our own uh, clients. So, and by doing this, also we are not uh, changing consumption of water in terms of absolute uh, figure. So it's exactly the same amount of water in terms of uh, cubic meters. But nevertheless, we are changing other behaviors. So we are uh, promoting. Uh, um, solution, uh, reusable solutions. So we are raising the awareness of consumers to this so important topic nowadays. Uh, and we also are demonstrating that tap water uh, presently uh, provides the quality demanded by consumers. Another aspect is that uh, this is very related with climate change issues because uh, when we are providing this kind of water to our customers, we are allowing them and also us by reducing 2000 times the carbon emissions related with the transportation of bottled water. And this was the last case that I had to share with you. So thank you so much. Uh, for the attention, and I will be available for questions, of course, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. I'm a client of your water refill station. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I move now to, um, to our next um, speaker, uh, Miguel uh, Araujo, who is the Communication and Public Affairs Director at the Superboc Group a leading Portuguese soft brands company that holds well-known brands such as Superboc Beer, Summers Bee, uh, Cider, and Vitalis and Água das Pedras Water. Miguel has been with the Superboc for quite some time, for over 20 years, initially known as Uni Unicer, and has a vast experience in trade marketing, in branding, in dealing with sponsorships, and has worked as the commercial director for the group's African market. And um, his motto is, impossible is nothing. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you, um, Miguel uh, Araujo. I uh, need to find among so many participants, you are there. Okay, whenever you are ready, Miguel. Hello, uh, first of all, my gratitude to uh, Catholic uh, Water Summit and, um, and also to be invited to share our experience and uh, initiatives uh, for the Superbook Group. Um, just a small uh, resume of our history, uh, 130 years ago, six small beverage companies from, brew uh, beverage company from Porto City, they just um, decide to join and build uh, what they call at that time CUFP, that was um, a company of uh, a union of brewer uh, small um, business. And then in 1977, the company became to call UNISA, that means uh, brewer union. So in 2017, we adapt the um, we adopt the name of our main brand, Superbock Beer, and uh, that's where where we are. So, if we can go through the next slide, please. Yes, Miguel. Um, sorry to uh, quickly interrupt you. Um, your you you are not um, visible on the screen. I think you have a virtual background on. Would you be able to switch it off? Yes. Okay. Can you see me? Because I put known. Uh, the video is not uh, back on yet. I have asked now to start your video. Sorry. If not, no problem. We can continue without uh, camera. Okay, I think it's better. Otherwise, we're going to sure. delay the. No problem. 
We can okay. perfectly hear uh, you, so go ahead. So can you go through the next slide, please? So this is like a common sense, but indeed everything begins with water. And uh, can you go once, one ahead, please, also? Um, we, uh, population, we use water for several reasons, for fun, for holidays, for drink also. But going to the next slide, um, indeed, uh, water is our most important supplier. Um, we uh, have three types of, of beverage, water, still and sparkling water, soft drinks and beer. But beer, the 95% of beer is made by water. So um, our products are water-based and uh, no water, no beer. Um, so can you go uh, ahead, please? So that's the point where we um, need to reinvent ourselves from a long period um, and start to um, management the three types of water we have in our products. We have water for production, the water that we fulfill into packaging and deliver to consumers. We have water for consumption of our employees and, and other teams. And we also have water for cleaning process. So we promote the water we use in our company. This is a quite confused graphic. Just pay, pay, pay attention to the left side. We have the different types of sources of water that we have. And also you can see that we have the um, returning water that we use from our fulfillment uh, procedures to uh, get advantage of reuse as much water as we can. Um, the next slide, please. So we have uh, some goals for a long time over water, energy, and steam. Um, looking for the, the blue board, we can see how the water consumption has be, have been decreased all over the last years. Um, the total of the group, because we have soft drinks, um, water plants and beer plants, the total of the group is 2.8 liters of water per each liter of uh, our beverage that we put in the market. In the beer plant is 3.0. But if you go back to 2010, it was 368. And if you go back to the beginning of the century, it was 4.8. So we um here after here um we through technology and uh, a lot of new procedures in terms of our production we have this mindset of reducing and reusing the water we use for uh, our business so this is like our mindset that to reach final products reusing as much water as possible also contributing to reducing the water consumption. Uh, we believe that energy resources and the water resources are the future of the sustainability that we um, must have in our minds. And that's the compromise that we have. The organization of Catholic and Water Summit just asked me also to link how we uh, interact with consumers. And I have two small slides where I can show you in our biggest brands in terms of water, in sparkling water, Pedras. Pedras is like a jewel in terms of sparkling water. It's one of the 0 0.5 sparkling waters in the world that has natural gas. So is as much pure as you can drink coming from, from nature, okay? So um, this is in Portuguese, but the, the left side, but um, we have several projects of full pedras, and one of them started in 2019. And this is like planting of 
3,000 trees in some forests in the north of Portugal, um, because we believe that reforestation um, can compensate also the water that we can be re we can reload it in the the, the aquifers. So going again, uh, forward to the Vitalis brand, that is our main steel water brand, we also promote a lot of several initiatives regarding the, the use, the right use of packaging, the right use of uh, how to manage the, the, the different uh, types of packaging that we have, plastic, water, um, glass, and also to educate people to use water um, in the um, as much efficient way as they can. So to resume, um, I can tell you that our main um, our main goals and our main uh, steps for are in in three stages: efficiency, so gradual investments in new technology in order to reduce the water use, also in the value chain to reduce water consumption along the value chain from barley plantation to the on stores. Uh, that we go to like cafes and restaurants and also compensation, compensate for water consumption through reforestation, large scale forests, allow water to be reloaded in, aquif in aquifers. So that's, that's solved. And I apologize that you were not able to see me, but I, th I think it was much more interesting to see the slides and the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to um, the, the four panel members for your talks. Very interesting to see how uh, uh, brands, uh, how companies are uh, moving more and more towards a sustainable um, uh, business, uh, sustainable businesses. Um, the consumption, uh, it's, it's, it's a topic uh, that we value very much uh, within uh, Catholic Lisbon. We have a research unit just for um, consumer behavior, marketing and consumer behavior, which I, I also belong. Um, and I believe we have an agreement that both, uh, from both the speakers and the, and the audience uh, through the launched polls uh, yesterday and today, that all stakeholders have a saying when it comes to saving water and uh, that a collective uh, effort is needed to take care of this precious resource in a sustainable way. Uh, according to recent research, more than 90% of consumers would switch to a brand supporting a good cause and, and nearly 50% would pay extra for products and services from companies committed to a positive environmental impact. So my question to uh, the panel members, um, have you been witnessing consumer uh, um, pressure to introduce products or, or uh, services that are more friendly, uh, water friendly over the past uh, decade? Maybe I start with uh, Miguel Monteiro. Cannot hear you. You are on mute. Okay. okay. All right. So yes, uh, we have been um, feeling some pressure uh, into moving for more um, water-friendly um, uh, products. Uh, and that's why we have been launching some some products as um, solid or uh, bar shampoos, uh, dry shampoos. So we are really doing a, an effort to 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 reduce and also in the fabrication process to 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 not reduce the usage uh, we have of water. In any case, I, I must tell that the it's not on water that we are feeling the most uh, of pressure. Uh, we what we see is that public opinion it's uh, pretty much uh, concerned today about plastics. So all the waste that are on plastics, uh, non-recyclable, and uh, the waste that we see on, on oceans and on uh, landfills, and also on other topics as um, biological, natural products. So these are the two themes where we feel that are a lot of pressure. Uh, we are uh, pretty sure that water will, uh, will come. But as we were already discussing in some other panels, I think people, the consumers, uh, they, um, they like the discussion, they understand it's a, a, an important topic, but on day, daily today, uh, daily life, they are not really yet uh, conscious of the, of the risk we are taking uh, and the lack of time we have to, 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 to take an action. Sure, thank you. Um, 
Pedro Lopes, would you like to comment on, on this on this uh, issue? Sure. Uh, as you know, we, we, we have uh, mainly five and four star hotels in the resort. So uh, our clients are very concerned with the utilization of resources, very concerned with uh, uh, do not spend too much water, do not spend plastic. For example, we, we abolished the, the plastic in terms of glasses, in terms of uh, a lot of, 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 of small things in the hotels. And yes, the, the, uh, I have to say that the clients are worried about it. And for example, we, we, we create an eco, eco resort in Troia, south of Lisbon, uh, close to a beach, and it's full. It's completely full and uh, um, is, is, a, is a resident resort. So it's a, we, saw, we, we are selling houses and all the houses are completely sold. And the people is very happy to, to be in an eco resort. So yes, the clients more and more are very worried. And they take a lot of care about the utilization of uh, our resources, mainly water, plastics, and, uh, and everything. Right. I'm really glad to, to hear that. Um, uh, Fernando, Fernando Ventura from Pingu Dos. Well, um, I must say that when compared to other environmental topics, uh, water has not been uh, a priority for consumers. Uh, at least uh, um, as uh, perceived as an environmental priority. So uh, plastics, I agree completely with Miguel, it's uh, number one topic, either in terms of uh, uh, reusable solutions or in terms of uh, uh, reduction of consumption or even uh, by improving recyclability. Uh, so this is number one topic then packaging in general or food waste or uh, climate change uh, those are topics uh, relevant for consumers at least for food retail uh, clients um, nevertheless for us uh, it's one of the major topics uh, for for our own activity and in terms of supply chain or, or uh, value chain uh, because uh, water is the essential resource for us to have food. So we use water um, as, as the main resource for everything or almost everything that we sell in our stores. And uh, furthermore, it has, um, it can, we can have uh, impacts uh, after or during the consumption phase. Um, besides all other uh, supply chain stages. Uh, so, but nevertheless, we are committed to, uh, to reduce the impact in all uh, value chain stages, of course. Yes, so it's a wake up call to the issue of water. Uh, I would like Miguel Araújo also to comment, please. Yes, we, we feel indeed that um, consumers and also our clients, um, nowadays become more and more concerned about the use of water and the spending of water. We feel that, for example, in our events, in our music events, for example, Superbox, Super Rock, we have a camping where people stay for four and five days. And we feel that this concerning about spending as less water as they can is, is now um, starting to be a mindset in the young in the young consumers, but also in our clients, we feel that uh, they, they, they have this, this kind of concern. Nevertheless, I think Miguel um, just, just um, said what, what, what I, I do agree with him, is that opinion public is still too concerned about the plastic. And for example, we have five different areas here in terms of sustainability, sustainability policy and plastic is just one of them. So energy resource like, um, like I did steam, like I said, steam or, or even electric, also water. And the last one uh, also to educate um, consumers and clients how to um, manage and use um, in a, in a friendly way, the resource that we have. 
Fantastic. So we are almost running out of time. I would like to thank you all the four panel members. You are very, very nice with your presentations. You respected the time. Uh, major takeaway, prioritize the topic of water. And uh, maybe there's a great opportunity to, to, you know, for companies to be working on campaigns, uh, communication campaigns in public policy to raise uh, the, awareness, the awareness of uh, saving water. Thank you so much um, to the consumption panel. Thank you. And now thank we move. Um, thank you. Uh, Manon? Thank you so much, uh, Vera, for, uh, for moderating this panel. And thank you all uh, to the panelists as well. Uh, before we move on to our final panel of today, uh, I would like to uh, launch one more poll with the question, uh, which of the following do you think is more important to overcome? There are two options, so I'm very curious to see your answers. All right, I'll leave it open a few more seconds for the last 14 seconds. All right. Well, as you can see, um, it is quite equally uh, divided over both uh, answers. So I'm guessing it's a, it's a problem that, um, that should, should be overcome in both the developed and underdeveloped uh, uh, countries. Um, thanks again, Vera. Um, as mentioned, we are off to the last panel of today, uh, moderated by Sofia Fernandes. Uh, I would like to ask my colleague, colleague Philippa, to introduce Sofia. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so it's a great pleasure that uh, I'm introducing Sofia Fernandes to you. She is head of marketing and projects at the BGI, Build Global Innovators, and her passion is to make business to grow. She's a strategist and has been working in the last four years with startups. And before, Sophia was launching new products in corporations. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you are an entrepreneur, or if you are looking for an entrepreneur, you should meet Sophia for sure. She will set you the right path to achieve your objectives. She's managing a portfolio with more than 100 startups uh, and a team with more than 10 people in BGI. And she loves to design and align strategies, motivating those around her and assure flawless implementation. So she has an experience working with startups in US and the, uh, in Europe. And she had, for the last years, increased her network, her horizons, and her will to create meaningful impact. And for that, we invited Sophia to moderate this panel. Welcome, Sophia. So the floor is yours. All right, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you, uh, Philippa, for, for the intro. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Nunu and Manu for the kind invitation and uh, for also letting me bring a little bit of the startups to this, to this uh, very interesting water summit. Um, so actually what uh, we want to see here right now is actually what's happening in Portugal uh, in the water community, let's say, and how can you, uh, all of the, the speakers and everyone that is here, work with them. Um, and so for that, I, I, I'm going to introduce as well the, the speakers that are going to be here with me today. Uh, and they will uh, uh, shortly pitch what they do and how can you work with them. So first is, uh, I'm going to go for alphabetic order. Uh, we have uh, Bruno Abreu, which is the CEO of Scoopic. We have Francisco Manso, the CEO of Trigger Systems. We have Mafalda Freitas, the head of Open Innovation at BetaEye. We have uh, Nunu Leit, the CEO of Scientia, and we have uh, Rui Teixeira, the CEO of Evo. Um, so I would also like to, to ask for you to unmute them. And I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to try to keep really on time, but it's going to be a little bit hard. 
um, I'm just going to ask for, uh, and the startups have to be ready for this, for the one minute speech of who you are uh, and what's your startup about. We can start with In Alphabetic Order by Bruno. Seria até estirar o som. Yeah. Everything, yeah, okay. Hello everyone, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Bruno Abreu, I'm the, the CEO, not the CTO, but the CEO of Scubic. Um, we are a data analytics company mainly, but we associate that knowledge with uh, electric engineering and electric efficiency and with hydraulics engineering uh, to optimize in real time the water networks. We, we as in the biggest, in big cities, we spend a lot of energy to transport the water from the rivers until our homes. And we, with real time optimization, we can reduce the energy costs associated with transporting water. And of course, increasing the water quality, increasing the efficiency of the water network, and most importantly, secure our water resource, which is finite. And we are having a lot of problems here in Portugal. But we are getting good results. We are reducing between five and eighteen percent of the energy bill on the systems that we are operating. So it has been an amazing journey last year. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Next, Sofia, you are unmuted. Oh. Yeah, only the Fitriel. Well, so maybe line. you can move for next one. Uh, okay, no, no. Uh, Do you want to add your pitch? Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much to to Catolica for the invitation and for for to, thanks to BGI for all the support so far. Uh, I'm Nuno here representing Scientia and Saltwater. Uh, we're an aquaculture startup uh, that's going to produce uh, meager, which is Curvina. Uh, but we are going to, to do it in a recirculating aquaculture system, which is a land-based closed system uh, where we control every parameter um, so we can promote the best welfare possible for the fish to grow. And this will be reflected in the, in the end product. Uh, we, we, will reuse, we can reuse the, the, all the water in the system around 95 to, to 99% um, each day. So, so we, it's a circular uh, system and we promote uh, sustainability. All right, thank you so much, Nuno. Uh, going back to Francisco. Francisco is unmuted. Uh, so it's, yeah. I can, I can go much. instead. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe while yeah. uh, Francisco is unmuted, Rui, uh, you can go. All right, all right, I can go. So my name is Rui Teixeira. I'm uh, also the CEO and the co-founder uh, of Ivo, um, a Portuguese startup from Aveiro. Uh, and we developed a technology to supply instant hot water uh, on buildings uh, and avoiding the waiting time for hot water. So we can increase uh, water and, uh, and the energy efficiency on buildings. Uh, we're targeting right now mostly the residential sector, uh, but we have solutions for uh, to install during construction, during reconstruction, or even solutions for do-it-yourself installation that can uh, uh, save uh, up to 12 liters of water in each shower. Uh, we are already in the market, and uh, of course, we are also we are looking for um, partners that could help us um, uh, help, uh, entering the market, and uh, mostly in Portugal and uh, in Europe. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rui. I will pass now to Francisco. Uh, that I think it's a mute now. now. Yes, we can. Okay, so my name is Francisco. Uh, I work in Trigger Systems. Uh, we are managing um, irrigation water uh, and we have developed uh, a very new uh, way to make irrigation that can save a lot of water. This was known in theory to be possible, but uh, there, was, uh, there, there wasn't any type of uh, um, a device that could manage the complexity of this new irrigation method. 
and we have been installing water uh, controllers in uh, um, in cities like Lisbon, for example, but also uh, in agriculture landscapes and golf courses. Uh, we have savings about uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent, which sounds incredible, but uh, it's it's achievable, and we are getting lots of uh, increasement in uh, in yield productions, which makes us very very happy about it. <laughs> Great, thank Francisco, thank you so much. And last but not least, Mafalda Freitas. I'm not sure if she's already unmuted. I am. I'm here, Sofia. Ah, great. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Mafalda. Um, I am an Open Innovation Program Director at PETAI. Um, I also want to thank Catolica and NBGI for the invitation to be here. This has been a very good summit and uh, on a topic that's very key to Portugal and, and to the world. So thank you for that. Um, for those who don't know Beta E, um, let me just introduce it quickly as well. We are a collaborative innovation consulting firm that's based in Portugal, but that's also working internationally. And we specialize in helping establish these relationships between startups and corporates, um, either through accelerating the startups or through our open innovation or business innovation program. So he, we have been here for the last 10 years helping to build the innovation ecosystem. And we carry this project in multiple sectors from FinTech to Agritech to Health and Pharma, uh, but very strongly also in the energy and, and blue economy sectors with the examples of free elections and blue tech that you, some of you might have heard about. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Maybe right now I'm gonna go uh, one by one with specific topics. So uh, I'm gonna start with, with Scubic. Um, so actually you have been uh, already working with Aguas de Portugal uh, and you also have been in contact with uh, USA, let's say, market uh, versus European market. Um, my real question for, for you would be how to navigate this public-private uh, situation uh, and, and how is the importance sometimes of the connection between startups and universities to actually build credibility to talk with corporates? Is this something needed? In your experience, uh, is it better to be a university spin out? Well, I'm going to begin with the last questions. Uh, no, it's terrible to be university spin out, especially <laughs> when you have to deal with water utilities. This is my opinion and my from my experience, because normally they think they are talking with academic guys that don't understand anything about what is real life and it, what is real business. So sometimes in some uh, types of markets, like, like the ones that we are getting in the water market, the water utilities market, being a spin-off from a university, it's not that good. That's from our experience that we have here in Portugal. When we get out of Portugal, things change a little bit. When you go to the US, they evaluate very much this. Since uh, Scubic began on a PhD thesis, and then we were transferring this technology to the market. They really like those type of collaborations between university and of course startups and with, uh, with companies. But anyway, in Portugal, from my experience, they don't like it. They think, like I was saying, they are talking with academics that doesn't know what is real life. Uh, from that part, it's, it's not the great part. The, the first question, how, how we can deal with the private and, and public entities? Since I was Portugal control around 80% of the Portuguese market, uh, it was a little bit tough to get in. Uh, we are working with uh, two different entities in uh, Aguas Portugal, in this case, Aguas do Norte and Aguas do Centro Litoral. Uh, well, it was difficult to get in, but when they start seeing the results that we are getting with our real-time platform, things change a little bit because uh, since we deal with energy efficiency, by the end of the month, when they receive the energy bill, they will see the difference between operating with Scubic and without Scubic. And things really, really change. And we have some follow-ons that after the first pilots, they want us to build additional studies and additional platforms for their water utilities. But uh, I think, and this is general in Europe, especially water utilities are very close to innovations. They don't like new things. They don't like guys saying how they should operate their water networks because they think what they are doing for the last 20 years, it's enough and it's very efficiently. But since they are installing a lot of sensors and the amount of data is increasing exponential, they will need for uh, advanced analytical solutions 
to help us uh, bring the, 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 the real value of data or picking the power of data and create real value with that data. It's not easy, but it's not the end of the world. But I think normal water utilities, especially on the public part, they like to work with established companies that are on the market for the last 10 years. Uh, they don't like too much with work with startup companies and the risk mm -hmm. that, uh, that comes with that. But again, we are, we are picking on the most advanced technology that exists in the market and on the universities and transferring uh, to, to the real world. And again, we are getting good results, but it's tough. Uh, it's the real tech transfer. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's tough. And especially some universities uh, are not even prepared to, to, to assist you on these transitions. Mm -hmm. Some companies don't know uh, how to deal with startups. Uh, mm -hmm. So sometimes it, it's, it's difficult, but again, show them results and you will convince them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I will go for a small, a slightly different, we will go back to this topic when I talk with Mafalda, but right now going to, to another startup, Cientia. Um, we see that, for instance, uh, not, not just being sustainable in terms of water, but some, also with the products related with it. For instance, the packaging uh, for, uh, for, for the product to be sustainable. Um, how do a startup look for partners? Um, is it important uh, specifically uh, in, in case of Cientia, which uh, it, it has a, a huge capex, a huge in, initial investment on infrastructure, how, how do you navigate this? Do you look for um, government support? For instance, you were one of the um, Ministry of Environment startups uh, from Circular for Goods as well, together with Scubic. Um, so how do, you, how do you navigate this? And how does a startup, so we, I talk about packaging. I talk a little bit about uh, finding this investment. If you go into a government site, make partnerships, and how do you actually find an investor uh, to be interested on, uh, on Cientia? All right. Well, um, because we advertise all these things regarding sustainability, transparency, um, biosecurity of our product, uh, because we, we can guarantee that we will have a premium product without any contaminants. We don't use any antibiotics or chemicals in, the, in our uh, fish tanks. So we can just have the end product and then deliver it when we process it in a plastic packaging or, or uh, just, it's just not sustainable. So we have to find solutions when we come to that point um, where our packaging uh, delivers exactly what we promise. And that has not been easy to find because there are not that many solutions in the market that just have those characteristics that we, we, we are looking for. Um, but that has been uh, uh, an area that has been in constant development. There are works with the, um, microalgae in, in cardboard uh, packaging, and we're looking forward to that uh, when it's market ready. Um, when dealing with the, the government for financing, it's not been that easy. Um, usually there are a lot of calls for, for funding to startups. And usually there's also this little note that uh, aquaculture is not eligible. Um, I really don't know why. Uh, maybe there is a separate funding for fisheries and aquaculture, but <laughs> usually it goes also fisheries. Uh, well, it's been, it's been hard also finding a private investor um, that will, especially in Portugal, that will understand the specifics of an aquaculture business because most investors are looking for a, a quick return in, in two, three years, and an aquaculture business takes a little bit more time because there's something we can't uh, overcome, which is the biology of the fish. It will take time to grow, and the company will take some time to, to make a profit. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, uh, we can grow a, a meager using this system, uh, uh, 2.5 kilos in around one and a half year, which is very good considering it takes uh, uh, sea bass, which is Roval, to grow 500 grams in two years or three years. Um, but there are some things we just can't speed up yeah. anymore. Um, and that has been some, the difficult part in, in, in connecting with an investor. Um, but we'll, we'll get there. Yes, of course you will. Um, I'm out right now moving a little bit, and actually today here uh, was uh, Pustana Group. I don't know if they are still here, uh, but Hibu, this could be a potential client for you. Um, 
so how is it to actually get to this corporate? Uh, you have been uh, actually funded by the European Union uh, by EIT Climate Kick, so that's a good incentive. You have been at the Web Summit. Uh, I, I was I, I was uh, um, happy and fortunate to be with you at the Web Summit and see uh, how you were actually showing everyone how your product work. What does it take for you to actually uh, scale? Because you already have clients and you get to that point, the sweet spot, spot where you already have revenues, but you want to scale up. Is it Climate Kick helping? Is it Web Summit? How do you reach the, the corporates? Is it through a Water Summit event? How do, what's the strategy? How do you see this um, for Hebo? Well, I hope that uh, Water, Web, Water Summit will help <laughs> after it, I can tell you. <laughs> No, but regarding regarding the technology, actually, we started uh, to address directly uh, the potential, uh, like uh, like Kristana um, Auto, for example, as you were saying. Uh, but we just realized that we have to come to the, we have to enter the normal uh, the normal channel of distribution. Uh, I would say with a, with a, with the normal uh, distributors, the normal representatives uh, on the on the countries. Uh, or locals, uh, let's say uh, construction material stores, for example, but some, somebody that is already uh, providing uh, these institutions and that gives them the trust that they need uh, when they are buying uh, a disruptive uh, uh, product. Well, the thing is that um, you are asking me uh, how to get to corporates. And of course, uh, there are huge corporates on that side as well in Portugal, but also uh, internationally. And it's not uh, easy to reach them uh, because, of course, that even when you have uh, a, a really innovative technology um, that is proved, that proved to, to 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 be innovative not only in Portugal but uh, but uh, uh, outside. Like uh, we we are just now opening a new contract in the US uh, and uh, like a, a big a distributor national because they know that there is no such thing like that uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, but the thing is that uh, when the product doesn't have market, uh, they also does, don't bother uh, these corporations because they don't have anyone else selling it. So they are not so interested to rush. And so that's one of the biggest problems that we, we feel when you are knocking on the doors of the big corporates uh, to get them to try, to get them to try if the market wants the product, uh, to, to make them validate our value proposition and to check uh, if their customers are actually paying the many the, the value that we are asking for 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 the product, uh, because we have made our research and we know that the customers pay the, the money that we are asking for that. Uh, but once again, the the problem is that uh, large corporations uh, they, they want to take it easy. Sometimes they want to to see you making your first steps alone and to 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 make the proof validation that you are able to 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 be here during some time and to be selling some quantities. And uh, of course, we have made some contacts with large corporations. They don't. The, the thing is that large corporations they never want to be out, but they never jump in. The thing is, they are a little bit in the in between. They want to check if their competitors actually jump in, and so they want to have you close. They're gonna buy you some samples. They're gonna test that. They're gonna make some some validations. But the thing is. Uh, that's not um, organic. That's something that, that, that comes and goes, and you know, just to leave some connection. So I, I really think that uh, whatever it's uh, this new technology, if uh, these large corporations sometimes they try a little harder to give it a try and to to and to actually to 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 make an effort to validate if this thing is real. Uh, to well, simply to say yes or no, uh, but not to leave it in the in the. In, in this in this uh, uh, gray zone, uh, that will be much better for the startups because uh, because even for yourself, you, you whenever you are bringing a new product to the market, you are not 100 percent sure if that's going to be a boom, a product boom that or, or a mass market product. Uh, but if you don't if you don't fight to 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 show that, then you can die during the way because you, of course the startups are always needing uh, additional funding uh, uh, when you are not when you are not. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, achieving uh, uh, stability on your business, uh, but that's that's what I feel when dealing with corporation. It's uh, it's a little bit frustrated because you know that you have uh, something that is much better than than the products that they have at their bench. That you know that the products that they have want to buy your product because you sell them directly to them, mm -hmm. and you know well uh, uh, a structure like that could sell uh, a thousand of that in a, in, a, in in a few time. But uh, the thing is that. Uh, they want to take things easy because business is going all right. So why should I care? <laughs> and and even 
uh, and that, uh, let's say, ecological concern comes after. The, the first one, of course, uh, uh, for Pingudos or for whatever, the first one uh, is, of course, to make sure that uh, that uh, your, your business is profitable. And, of course, it, it should be like that. But I just think that uh, sometimes, and even if you want to strongly support uh, uh, startups, as it happens in other countries, uh, I think Bruno was uh, talking about the uh, U.S., uh, uh, and, and of course, like US, things are completely different there. And that's why we see that some uh, great uh, startups become some large corporations because people actually take the risk because uh, people uh, actually believe. Uh, but what I feel in here in Portugal is that when I'm uh, knocking the door of a corporate, I, I, will, I, will, I have to deliver exactly the same as if I would be a large corporation, all right? I'm a startup, but I have to deliver exactly the same. Uh, so it's not any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, benefit uh, or, or, or at least some, some, some uh, help at the, at the interest. And sometimes you are not good enough because you are not mature enough and you just miss a step and you, you don't have a second one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rui. Uh, now going back to, to, to Trigger Systems and, and Francisco, um, and also with the point that you were also nominated uh, and financed by EIT Climate Kick, EIT Food, you have been uh, highly distinguished in several prizes. Um, and actually, you are in a very noble uh, part of Lisbon. Parque Eduard Setim has your irrigation system. Um, so how does this visibility and uh, does influence with the relationship, relationship with the corporate? And as well as a startup perspective, um, uh, how much time should you also invest in uh, applying for potential grants, etc.? Um, rather than sometimes looking for uh, sales directly, like how do you manage these inside trigger? Yeah, that's that's one of the big uh, um, uh, doubts that we have, and nowadays uh, since uh, uh, some experience that we have with uh, winning some prices and sometimes losing focus of the market, and other times that we have focused on the market and lost probably some prices. We have, uh, um, uh, these are like two parts of the brain that don't, can, uh, don't uh, get along together. So either we are focused on the market and we go very fast in sales and product development, or we, we go to the, to the recognition or, some, or to prove some, some other, um, uh, to, to some others people that uh, that we, what we have is really good and, and can really make a difference and uh, and uh, and we lose the the other one this year for example i think we we have we have not uh, won any prize and will not participate in any contest and uh, we have focused on the sales uh, last year we did exactly the opposite we mainly we, we were 30 uh, percent uh, of the company was focused on on prices and um, and the prices were very important for for now engaging with the, with the companies. Not only the prices, but especially the support that we got uh, during the mentoring parts and so on. Like for example, the program from BGI or or, or IAT, AET, we we got a lot of support, a lot of knowledge, which was very very important. But but uh, this year we feel that we need to run uh, now to the targets. Uh, and this is what we are we are doing. Uh, AT is now part of our of our company, so they are acquiring some of our capital. Um, we have been growing the sales a lot and growing the use cases a lot. But every company is like we still are a startup, and I, I think we are going to be a startup for the end of our life. And we have to prove again and again and again. Even if we have made seventy percent savings on parking lot safety more. 30% savings on, on all the, com the, the companies that we have engaged on. Still, the next sale is again a, a new sale where we have to prove, we have to do a pilot again. And even we got lots of other use cases, still is a new challenge. We are now this year going to enter strongly on, on Spain. Uh, also, all the, the other stuff that we did seems that it, it doesn't matter. And uh, I'm sure it will be like that forever. So. Um, it's 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 as as it. So every day we have to prove ourselves. Like uh, I was listening to Rui and, and feeling that we will never be a, a big company. We we will always be a, a small company. We will have a good 
we will always do pilots for everybody, but uh, we are now engaging with big companies that can really scale up a lot of products. And uh, we are very happy with this. This year was the best year of our, our lives in terms of work. Well, congratulations on that, Francisco. Mafalda, I, I leave you here uh, after all the startups because I'm going to pick up on some of the things they said. Uh, to, to also um, try to check it with you. So Betai does a lot of uh, programs in open innovation, uh, one of them specifically with the Portuguese government in the blue economy sector, um, others for private corporates. Um, so my first, I, I will do here um, a sum up of things. My, my first point would go for, especially in the water economy, Mafalda, do you still feel um, it has to be the government uh, over the private sector, uh, or how is this balance, or at least at Petai, how, how do you feel it? Also, we saw you do a lot of open innovation programs, so you can have a good vision of Portugal versus the other countries, um, and also give us probably a, a sense of this. Um, and another question that I would like to add, so it's not two, it's three, uh, this point that uh, Bruno said at the beginning. Um, so you do do a lot of open innovation, and how do you pick up the startups to start working with the corporates? And do you feel also that being from university sometimes might be a handicap or, or how does Betai rebrand this in a way that, uh, that corporates uh, are, are very much more open? Uh, I, I think that Mafalda is, is muted. It's Mafalda Freitas. Thank okay. you. So a lot of questions, Fia. <laughs> not very easy. Um, but but yeah, ju just picking up on, on the on all that I've been hearing so far, I always find it amazing to hear from the startups, also from the corporates, but mostly from the startups, because I think that's the beauty of being a startup. Also, the challenge. It's uh, I think that I don't have a startup, but I think that should be the your driver every day, right, to, to overcome those challenges. And uh, I always find it amazing. And I do believe in collaboration, but AE is all about collaboration and I know how tough that can be and I know how tough can can be for a startup to approach um, to approach a corporate or to approach a government entity because I, I think that uh, if we go to the basics it's just very th these are just very two very different entities in their nature right so a startup is um, this eager to grow, eager to do, unstructured, informal entity that's very flexible, very adaptable, very fast uh, that sometimes is more focused on uh, one specific challenge only, and they are very, very good at that specific challenge. And corporates and government entities, they are dealing with hundreds of different concerns at the same time. They are big, so they are slower. Um, and and, and this, aligning these different expectations, is, it's not an easy thing to do, and a, a lot can go wrong in that if people don't respect these differences and they don't consider them when they are trying to establish these relationships. So if I recall correctly, your first question about, about uh, the, the water um, sector, yes, I think that in Portugal, and I think that Bruno also mentioned that uh, it's still a very government-driven uh, sector. Um, so it's very legacy-based, very still a little bit old. And I mean, things have been working for the past uh, 40 years, so why it change, right? And this is normal and it's something that we see in Portugal and all over the world. If things are working, why are we going to change them? Uh, so I guess it's a very tough um, market to, to get in uh, for a startup. But I also feel that things are changing and are changing not just because of water. One of the things that I believe, that's why I believe in collaboration is you are never alone in a sector, right? The sectors are interdependent and things are linked to each other. So it's not just about the governance, it's not just about the corporate that's dealing with water. It's also about the cities and smart cities. It's about uh, energy, it's about industries. So there's so much that's pushing the water sector that I believe that things are going to change and are starting to change. I also believe that because it's very government oriented and it's still very, um, old in a not not a negative way um there is this uh risk uh, aversion uh and startups and you guys know it uh you are seen as like these risk takers and these not so safe uh things to go for so it's the, it's very normal that there's this clash and that there's this disruption um and i that's why i do believe in these open innovation programs i think that they bring um 
exactly what both corporates or governments and startups need. They bring the structure to the startups, processes to follow that make the corporates and the government a little bit less afraid of taking the risks with these startups. And that's why they are, they are okay, because you find this common ground, this common purpose, um, and you're all committed into going into something with a goal in mind. Uh, and that common goal and common purpose actually helps you in overcoming any barriers that, that may take place. Um, so I do believe that in order for things to be more successful, startups and entities, bigger entities, need to find some sort of framework to work with and not just uh, this random case-by-case um, case chance sometimes is not the best option. And Sophie, if you can help me remember the, the, the last second question. Uh, uh, my last one was uh, this connection in universities uh, and how to do the tech transfer for corporates. Yeah, well, uh, we haven't, um, I, I can't say, I, I believe in you, Bruno, when you say that. Uh, if adding to the risk of startups, having a startup that comes from an university background, I can understand why people would be afraid of, of committing to something and I can understand businesses do want to find startups that know what they are talking about, that know their businesses, that know their challenges. So I believe that can happen. Uh, but I think, and I, I know that there is a difference between what you see uh, in Portugal, between what you see in the world. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't believe it's a matter of, like you're saying, Sophia, marketing. I believe it's a matter of communication. It's finding the right path for communication. It's understanding what they want, what corporates or governments need to hear, um, and and be more focused in that. Um, because as you were saying, once you show them results, uh, it's 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 all about results, right? It's all about overcoming that risk aversion at, in the first place. So I do believe in that. It's not disguising, and there is a lot of value from coming from universities, and that um, the, the the science that's related to that and the knowledge that is related to that is very valuable. Uh, so I do believe it's a matter of um, showing off what you can do. Uh, again, that's why I believe in these open innovation programs because there is this space for you to do it. Um, that would be my, my advice. <laughs> All right, uh, we are over time. Uh, I thank you so much, Bruno, Francisco, Mafalda, Nuno and Rui for joining us here today. I'm not sure we have Time for Q and A, so I will lead. Uh, I will. I will ask Mano and Filipa help in this sense. Uh, and and but anyway, I just want to thank you all for this overview. For me, we would continue the conversation, <laughs> but we have to finish. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Sophia, for uh, moderating this panel. Uh, unfortunately, indeed, we are running uh, a bit late, so um, I would like to ask any participants with questions to address them in the chat, and we will for make sure to forward them to the panel members. Um, for now, I would like to ask uh, Nuno uh, to uh, come back to us with a wrap-up of the conference. Hi, thanks, Manon. Uh, I mean, we really needed the startups to finish this, uh, this uh, water summit because, I mean, we were running out of energy after six hours, but the level of energy that we brought to the discussion was just amazing. Thank you very much for that. It was really good. Um, I mean, I'm about to close. I'm really uh, six hours talking about water. I've learned a lot and I'm sure everybody learned a lot. Uh, yesterday, the quality of the presentations was just amazing. We had 700 views on Facebook yesterday, and I'm not, I have no doubt, no doubt that today we will have even more. Uh, all of these will be, um, has been recorded and will go to Facebook later this afternoon, uh, today. So it was really amazing. Yesterday, as I said at the beginning, we left with four key messages. Water scarcity is undeniable. Business have a clear role to play. Partnerships are crucial and time for action is now. And more or less, we saw it confirmed. And I'd let me just, in two minutes, try to, to take my takeaways. I mean, we started with the inspirational story from water.org, right? And, and the, 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 the way they talk about it, it's, again, the water scarcity problem, but it's much more than that. It's this vision that it's about crisis. I mean, water crisis is a health crisis, it's a human crisis, it's a children education crisis. Six hours to collect water. So that's what brings this emotion into this story that says this is seriously an issue. And I always come back to, the, to what, what Philippe said yesterday at the beginning. I mean, there will be a moment if we are not careful that water will have the price of diamonds. 
Then we have Gubeng instead. I mean, fantastic. The, the, the moment was great. I mean, the, 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 at the end of the day, it, it was, it's one of the most important studies done in Portugal in the last years, and it was announced today. So for us, it's a privilege. I'm very grateful to, to Gubeng to have done that. They basically said that Portugal is a high risk uh, country in terms of water stress. And the 10 messages that came out of the study are very, very clear. And it's what they will be framing in order to promote sustainable usage of water. And we, Catholic, would love to be part of that. And uh, forging those partnerships is part of our role and we'll certainly try to do that. Then we had the panel on the Portuguese ecosystem and it was really engaging. We heard about Portugal success story but also the warning that clear public policies and regulation need to be there in the future. I love the, the, the idea of the trust and memory that Maria João uh, left, uh, left with us. We had a panel of conception afterwards with, with uh, four industries. Yesterday we have five industries, different industries. Today we have four, cosmetics, beverages, retail, tourism. So it's, 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 it's uh, very diverse. Uh, and it's all about, again, the same message from yesterday. The businesses have a role to play and the time to action is now. L'Oreal was very clear, no water, no business, 50% reduction in the last 15 years. Uh, amazing, I, I really was impressed with the concept of the water loop factory, fantastic. <laughs> and again, yet again, we have another disclosure today. I mean, it's worldwide new sustainable ambition for L'Oreal was presented today, it's amazing. And they have very clear water targets in various dimensions, from supplies to products. And I'm, I, I was really impressed with that. And then we heard about Pustana, the two important projects they have in Algarve in terms of water reuse and desinalization plan. Very pragmatic, very operational, and it's things moving. Then we had the Pink Dose and the, the, the idea of the refillable water bottles and all the, 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 the sustainable policies that they have. Also encouraging to hear that. Superboc, no water, no beer, they said. <laughs> which is basically true, right? And which means that uh, the mindset, as they said, the mindset, because they are very clear that no water, no beer, mindset is to reduce consumption and the clever use is part of their culture. And then we have startups. I mean, uh, I have no doubt that most of the water problems will only be solved with innovation and uh, what we heard, uh, at least to me and I'm sure to everybody, it gives us a lot of hope. The Portuguese ecosystem of startups is just fantastic. I'm very close to them, uh, Sofia now, and I'm really always amazed with the level of energy, level of creativity, and especially, and I hope you'll never lose that, the, the level of challenge that you provide to the system. The new message that I found today will, came from you, which is about cultural change, which is about resilience, which is about risk-taking, something, uh, two or three key concepts from the behavior point of view, that need to change in order for water, whatever it is, needs to be brought to the table to help uh, solve most of the issues that the planet is facing this day. So yesterday we had 700 people. I'm sure that we'll have more today on Facebook. We hope to be able, as Catholica and the center, to be able to build on everything that we have heard and try to energize some sort of partnerships to raise up to this challenge. It's part of our job. We'll make sure that will happen. This was our first summit. We decided the topic was water. There will be other topics in the future. So welcome to the next Summit of Catholica, wherever it will be about. Thank you very much.